In prison, there are literally in the rule book ways to appropriately take care of yourself. You're supposed to turn with a blanket over you facing the wall. From the top down, they're like, hey, if you gotta do it. It's written in by some bureaucrat from the state capitol, yes. Yeah, that guy's a hero. We gotta get that guy on the line. Because they're well, all like, no jerking off the prison. One guy was like, come on. He kind of like, raises his hand. What if they turn to the side? So I was just smashing the Fifi bag. <laughs> And this female prison guard, I just see her eyes pop into the window of my cell. I was embarrassed like my mom had just caught me jerking off. And then the next day, I'm like walking by her towards the yard and I just kind of nodded at her and I go, CEO? And she smiled at me and she goes, Mitchell? <laughs> 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 she knew! This is Johnny Mitchell. You know him from his appearance on Flagrant and his channel, The Connect, with Johnny Mitchell. He was a multi-million dollar drug trafficker with ties to the Sinaloa cartel. He ended up getting clipped and spent time in federal prison. And today we're talking about how he survived as a first-time offender, how he smuggled drugs for the prison shot caller, and how stand-up comedy got him out of prison. This is just an amazing conversation. Johnny is hilarious and has amazing stories that he actually didn't tell on Flagrant or on his channel ever. Enjoy Johnny Mitchell. Welcome to camp. Hell Johnny yeah. Mitchell. Yes, sir. What's up, Marky, what's up, baby? Good to see you, man. Thanks you too, so much for dude. coming through. Obviously, you came on Flagrant, which was dope. Yeah. Was the was there a residual from that where people were hitting you up like Pussy? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I had that flagrant clout, dog. Go. Yeah, yeah. Now I'm in a relationship. I love you, sweet. But I fucking I had some I had some residual pussy. <laughs> Thank you, Andrew. That's fuck dude. None of us are getting that. All, no. of us, all of us are married. You can stop fucking our fans, dude. Well, yeah, Please, yeah, that, yeah. You have to stop that. Yeah, I will. I will. Okay. My bad, dude. <laughs> That's My bad. Up. Yeah, you guys are all married. Yeah. You know, but I think you'd need that because, like, I can't imagine. Yeah, the you DMs. want us to need that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You're like, I'm exactly. glad you guys are that way. Yeah, stay married, Sorry, bro. Just fucking sweep up the streets. <laughs> yeah, dude. But I can't imagine what your DMs like if you were a single guy, like like Andrew, right? Yeah. With. I, with 40,000 followers, I could show you what I'm working with. Yeah. But if you got okay. millions, it's like you would have no time to do anything else. Yeah. It could bring a weak man to his knees. Are, are girls into the, like, not only, you know, you being on extremely prestigious podcast. Yeah. But you also having, like, a criminal history. Are yeah. people into Absolutely. that? Absolutely. Really? Absolutely. That's, yeah. that, is it the right type of women? No, it's not a woman you would probably want to settle down with. Yeah. You know, um, like the girl I'm with now, who I'm in love with, she she didn't know about any of this shit. You're like, that's not what impressed her. She liked you for the jokes. Yeah, <laughs> not even that, in fact. I think it was the height. Yeah, yeah I got yeah. a few things working for me. Um, but yes, there's 5% of women, uh, which is like my fan base. It's like 95% dudes, 5% chicks yeah. that are, you know, that have some trauma, missing a father. Dad might have been in prison. Who knows what it is right. that's unresolved. And they just like, they like a bad boy. Yeah. And that's because, but that's misplaced. They shouldn't like a bad boy. They should like me for a bunch of other qualities, but they mistake <laughs> alpha. Yeah. They mistake psychopath for alpha. Yeah, Do you know what I mean? Because their dad may or may not have been alpha psychopath. Well, but it's what Jordan Peterson talked about. Like women like an alpha mm -hmm. and psychos and sociopaths uh, have this confidence of like an alpha male. They yeah. have the charm, the drive. These things that biologically women are attracted to, you know, for mating purposes, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But young women, especially, mistake those qualities in a psychopath for like a a, a alpha protector. You know yeah, what I mean? Yeah. I feel bad for those dudes that are like, yo, I'm just gonna get like a ton of money, and I'm gonna like fucking have all these things that yeah. will attract women, and then they don't attract the women that they actually are looking for. Right. And then they're like, dude, all these hoes aren't. Lo it's like, bro, yeah, they get cheated on, and you're all attracting this shit. women that like vanity. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Exactly. <laughs> like, yeah. You're attracting that type of bra. That's the one who's gonna go off and fuck drink. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah, exactly. So, Which good for them. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. But I am who I am first. Like I, I'm, you know, I pride myself on being this, you know, whatever, whatever I am comes before the money, any kind of cloud I have, you know what I mean? Yeah. And like the money never made me. The yeah. drug money never made me. I never bought anything, dude. Really? I, I had a, a dope apartment in Portland, Oregon. I had a penthouse, right? Overlooking yeah. the river. And I two had a couple a of let's go, bro. That's what it was back then. Yeah, it was like two G's. Right. Yeah. And I would just go in. I would rent different spots around Portland furnished. Mm -hmm. And I just lived out of a suitcase and I would go. I had no credit, no, oh, really? no background no nothing. I remember I'm, I'm 23, 24. And everything's basically cash. I would walk in and this was like around the recession times. So you, you could pay a landlord like don't do a background check. Here's six months, six months rent. Here, bro, here you go. That happened to my dad one time. So back in the day, my dad was a, so he moved from Montreal, 
okay. to South Florida. The oh, second wow. he turned 18, he's like he didn't learn English till he was like 15, 16. And so the second he can like learn English, get out of Montreal, he goes to South Florida because like he grew up in the shitty part of Montreal mm-hmm. that was like he was dirt poor, like yeah. no money. Yeah. His dad was kind of in prison a little bit. Yeah. And so he's like, bro, there's these Cuban like fucking refugees basically yeah. driving Lambos. That's crazy. So he goes down there, starts managing an apartment. He's been, like, he knows a guy in Montreal that has an apartment, and he's mm-hmm. like, "Yeah, you can live there for free. Yeah, just like fix it up, be the landlord, yeah. manage like all yep. the tenants in the spot." Yep. And this is in like Fort Lauderdale, like Surfside, and uh, Pat Manila. You ever heard of him? No. He's like an old like uh, I don't even know where he's from, like Colombian, Italian. I don't know, but he was like a drug dude back in the day. He ended up getting locked up, died in prison. I'm pretty sure, and he did the same shit with my dad. Literally, like, walks in. My dad never been in drugs ever, never knew anything about this. He walks in one day. Like, he's like, hey, Francois, can we talk? And he's like, sure. He knows his history a little bit. Mm. Pat Manila walks in, shuts the door. He's in there with, like, three other guys. My dad, at this point, is, again, like, 20-something. He's just like, what the fuck? And I think he, like, my oldest brother is born. Like, his wife is upstairs in the unit. My older brother's in there as a baby. And my dad's just like, okay, what's going on, Pat? Closes all the blinds. And he's just like, so look, I'm going to be living here for a while. My dad's like, yes, you are. (laughs) And then literally gets like a trash bag full of money, drops it on the table. He's like, count this up later. This should be good. Uh, Follow up with me in a year. That was it. Wow. And he had like three units in the building. Like that was Mm -hmm. insane money. My dad never seen that money in his life. He literally just like drops it off in a bag. Boom. And so he rented three spots in the building. Pretty much. to, To hold one to hold the work probably. One to hold money, one to hold the guns. Or he the, didn't ask the, questions. The hookers or whatever. He was like, yeah. whatever you need, you yeah. got the cash. I'm not fucking with you. Like, you're It's good. pretty amazing. Like, even like people that would call themselves upstanding citizens, squares, yeah. like, like how they change, how money gets them to, turns the lever, yeah, gets yeah, them yeah. to move shit. Like, yeah, you course. know, I'm moving into a building uh, owned by a lawyer in Portland and he has no business renting to a guy like yeah, me. Yeah, yeah. I'm like, well, how's, how's six months down sound? And you're like, oh, hey, look it. Turns out your background's fucking That still works now, clean. even without, like, my dad's biggest fear, I think, was, like, crime. Like, yeah. he knew that this guy had bodies and shit. It was like, he knows where my wife lives. He knows where my kids are. He knows yeah. where I am, whatever yeah. you want. But, like, even in New York now, you just be mm-hmm. like, hey, can I pay three months up front? For sure. And they're just like, all right, you can beat out the other tenant that's, like, figuring out the broker fee. Right, you know what right, I mean? exactly. But, yeah, money will just sway anyone exactly. to do whatever. Exactly, exactly. But, but, yeah. but, yeah, no, that's all I had. It's all I, I didn't, I lived, like the value of money to me was freedom. That's Mm -hmm. all that I wanted. You know, even as a young kid before I, you know, really had these like street dreams, these drug dealer dreams. I'm Mm -hmm. like, this thing moves. This, this is go. Yeah. You know, the gangsters called it go on the West coast. Mm -hmm. Cause if you got it, that's a green light. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, you know, I just traveled everywhere. I would be in midtown Manhattan staying for a week with you know walking around with 30 grand in my pocket cash yeah imagine i'm 23 years old walking lick bro. yeah 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 <laughs> but never though never got stuck yeah you know so but you never considered leaving portland like why not just like go to la and keep it moving like, well that's what i was planning on doing you uh, know? Before but they you got, got to me up. first yeah uh, yeah yeah damn. yeah and then so, you so I've, everyone that's listened to flagrant at this point like knows basically like the first part of the story like yeah working with the sinaloa cartel yeah. and like all that shit mm-hmm. and then the thing that basically gets you caught up you are shipping weed sniffed out by a dog they catch it and then you get thrown in prison yeah they caught the money they now, never got oh, any work that, that's what it was yeah and so all the guys i talked to though that have like done criminal past always go from weed to coke because it's like smaller doesn't smell why did you never do that again I was making too much money moving weed. But couldn't you have made more doing coke? With a lot more transactions and a lot more risk, maybe. Mm -hmm. But if you think about it, you know, it just depends on the price you're getting per unit. Mm -hmm. It's all broken down to math, right? So if I'm making $1,500 profit per pound, if I'm buying it for 25, let's say, and selling it for 4,000, what am I getting? What can I get for a kilo bought on the West Coast? What's the markup going to be in New Jersey or New York? Mm-hmm. Maybe it's a lot higher. Yeah. Right. I'm not sure how much higher, though. It just right? seems like it's like, yo, you can sell a key for 20, 20 G's. Like. If it's going on the West Coast back then, uh, you know, we're talking 2008. You could probably get, you know, my Cena Lowens probably could have plugged me for like 28. Mm-hmm. So what can I get for it over here? 32, maybe. You yeah. know what I mean? So uh, and how many people can buy? 
wholesale like like bulk at a time yeah not many no there's not many groups that can buy 20 kilos at a time yeah. but i got 10 guys that can buy 20 pounds at a time yeah so you see the math is like every week it's the same thing mm -hmm. right so it's a very it's a very small fraction of people that can move wholesale cocaine and uh make huge money and now that you've gone like so public with a story being on flagrant mm -hmm. like obviously having your own channel which is fire thank you are you how many of these guys are calling you up like oh dude i, I got dms every day trying like, to trying to get get my connect not oh but like are the connects calling you up being like hey man is everything square like no the connects aren't calling me up they've, they've long been they've long since disappeared gotcha. into whatever it is back to mexico dead in prison Fuck. yeah i'm not worried about the connects because i i never i never talk about the connects you right. know i never i really like you know took my time standing up and you know that's why i got whatever kind of street cred is left yeah. it's because i didn't rat you know yeah, yeah yeah i want to know more about the prison time specifically yeah how long were you incarcerated uh almost 20 months so yeah, yeah. it was just a it was a cat nap really like to talk talk to somebody like unique i mean he like scoffs at that yeah. at, at, at a year and a half two years in prison yeah but bro. you know it was hard time though it was like county jail denied bail fighting maximum security prison living through riots where people are getting stabbed uh doing time in the hole mm -hmm. in solitary multiple months spent in solitary why, you know so why, why were you in solitary again fighting um getting caught with contraband uh, and then when you first get shipped off, when you first get sentenced, you leave county jail, you get shipped to, you don't get shipped straight to the prison where you're going to serve your time. You get shipped to like a holding facility. It's like diesel right? therapy where like they drive you around to a bunch of spots. You ever heard that before? I've heard of that. That's yeah. more in the feds. Okay. This was in the state. They bring you to, it's just like a FedEx sorting facility. They send all the packages to one place. And then they get shipped off to whatever part of the country they're going to. It's the same thing with inmates. Yeah. So you all, you go to this one holding facility and they just wait to find where your bed space is going to be mm. depending on where your you know your security clearance your security level all that shit. i've heard that those holding spots can be worse because you don't have any papers yeah though those are really bad and but you're also locked down basically two four seven it's like being in the hole yeah you know what i mean and so that sucks you're like i'd much rather be at a facility and not be walking around you want to get to your home yeah once yeah. you know you're getting locked up like it's done there's no we're not beating this you got to go sit down mm -hmm. you just want to get to where you're going as fast as possible right you know, and, let's speed the misery up and then you, know? you get linked up who was your uh your your bunkie my celly your celly uh, my celly bunkie bunkie, like, bunkie works i like bunkie, bunkie better, works actually. yeah I'll be honest. yeah okay my bunkie he uh <laughs> it sounds like we're at camp yeah, you know it's way cuter <laughs> <laughs> yeah uh jimmy yeah, Jimmy, yeah. I won't say his last name because uh, I think he is still alive, but he's hanging on by a thread. Jimmy, and he was, uh, you know, he was the shot caller for the Hell's Angels, That's the right. biker gang, big on the on the West Coast. Yeah, and uh, yeah, that was that was my celly. Now, part of the story that someone pointed out to me that I'm curious for clarification. Yeah. I don't know how this works. Obviously, mm -hmm. I've never been to prison. But when you're locked up, doesn't the priority person get bottom bunk? Oh, yeah. Um, he could have taken whatever bunk he wanted. I you, think he preferred top. Yeah, I think he did. I don't know why exactly. That, maybe is, they were. Ma that's a good question. Maybe because they were really coming down on him at this time. Uh, they so were really they were starting to squeeze him a little more. Uh, like even though he had a couple of guards in pocket, he was really like uh, they were trying to break him mm -hmm. because he was in the last days of his like really running the show, bringing in contraband, smuggling crystal meth and, you gotcha. know, uh, you know, ordering hits and things so like that. Like, I'm not going to ruffle anything. <clears throat> yeah, I think they I, they might have mandated him to do that, but oh, I fuck. don't exactly remember. Oh, that's wild. But part of me thinks he could have taken whatever the fucking bunk he wanted. You know I, what I mean? I think all of you know <laughs> whatever yeah. he wanted. He yeah, yeah, got. yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean, he knew like when I used to like do favors for him and shit, like take balloons to the fucking the the kitchen, right? Yeah, because he loved being sold up with me because I was the squeaky clean guy who was fish out of water. Like, what the fuck is this kid doing here? You know <laughs> yeah, what I mean? Yeah, People yeah. inmates would walk up to me and be like, huh? What? <laughs> yeah. What? Yeah. White collar. You couldn't shit, have right? made a call. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Like you must have had a dog shit lawyer. Yeah. And I was like, yeah, yeah. I mean, evidently. Yeah. You know? Was your lawyer actually? Bad? No, he was great. I paid him fucking 50 G's. I mean, like. He, he, you know, he was, he was, 
he did the best with what we had to work with. Should your sentence have been longer for what happened? No. I mean, potentially. If I had had a public defender, I probably would have done triple the time. Really? So I guess it should have been longer. It makes but that much of a difference, having a public defender versus absolutely. paying a guy 50 Gs. Absolutely, because this guy had been, you know, working in the Portland, you know, criminal justice system for 20 years. He knew every DA, right? He knew every judge. And it just, when they know you, it's like a social club in, in these political bureaucracies, right? The, the DAs. Many of them become criminal defense lawyers, right? Oh, this guy used to be a DA too, Gorski. I called him the fat man. He used to be a prosecutor, oh, right? Wow. And so many prosecutors, they get paid shit, right? For the most part. Right. So they many of them be, go into private practice as criminal defense lawyers because they know the, the system so well. So, um, so I just think that helps, right? He can just sit down and level with the DA be like, look, it's kind of fucked up how <clears throat> connection based it is. Like, absolutely. Like, Yo, absolutely. I'm going to hire. Like if you have the ability, which you did to like hire someone that's connected, yeah, it makes that much of a difference. First, you get like a public defender that's in there, like trying his best. You know, twenty-two year old kid just passed the bar, yeah. and he's like, yeah. "All right, yeah. let's go help some people." Bro, but it doesn't make you feel any better because you get assigned as soon as you get locked up. Even if you're gonna pay your own lawyer, they assign you. They assign you somebody, right? Mm. So you get on the phone with them, and they're just reading off like what you're facing, like it's a fucking Postmates order. They go, oh, "Okay," so I so I get on the phone with my you know public pretender we call them dump trucks <laughs> if you got a dump truck you're in trouble dude yeah um he goes uh okay yeah so a uh, conspiracy to traffic marijuana conspiracy to commit money laundering uh bribery it just keeps reading it and reading it and my heart's just sinking and he goes he goes yeah you know, we're looking at about five to seven what and i go yeah, yeah i get fucked and i <laughs> hung up the phone and i'm like and i called my mom i'm like get the fat man down here ASAP. Yeah, dude. Fuck. I, yeah, immediately. There's got to be like, like if I'm, I would do a GoFundMe. If I got yeah. locked up, I'd be like, yo, GoFundMe to get right. me a real attorney because that's good. years of your life. Yeah. Yeah, that exactly. Are literally, and so were, you were able to use the money from, is it, why were you able to use the money that you had stashed to pay the, your attorney? Well, he had a retainer, first of all. So I'd already paid him 20 grand in cash beforehand like months beforehand oh really right yeah, exactly so and that's just that's just so i can get him on the phone like this is the here's 20 g's Take in case call. something happens and this is 24 24 7 i get a hold of you oh, wow. you know what i mean that's another privilege that giving an attorney five grand won't get you right you pay an attorney five g's he'll call you on monday wow you give him 20 I'm going to be able to get a hold of you on Saturday yeah, when you're yeah, on your boat. Yeah, yeah, dinner time. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Step away. Oh, that's crazy. Yeah. So the guy should do that. Like if you have money and like yeah. you're popping right now, yeah. get the best fucking attorney Oh, you yes. Can. If you're a drug dealer watching this show, <laughs> you must, if if you're rolling around like shit's sweet, you're, you're heading for a crash. You're heading for a hurting. Yeah. Because if something happens, you need to be prepared. You mm -hmm. have to, you have to always in the back of your mind, believe that you could get locked up fuck then and, you got to know it's going to end or else you're probably going to end up snitching too because you're going to yeah. get caught and you're going to be so stuck and you're going to panic and you're going to open your mouth you know yeah and did you when you got locked up did you ever like pay for protective custody or no. like you never no. did that no 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 why no because well first of all protective custody going to pc uh pcing up mm -hmm. that means i would have to that's a completely segregated uh, wing of the jail or prison, right? Gotcha. So I would have to make up an excuse. I'd have to be like, hey, I'm scared for my life. They don't just send you there. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? So I would either have to get beat up or I would have to, you know, pretend that like I was getting threatened. Do guys ever do that? Would they ever start a fight, lose just to go to PC? Uh, some gangbangers would. Really? Because it would get that sometimes, especially in Cali prisons, but it happened in Oregon too. Guys who are really on like level four yards that are just living a crazy gang banging lifestyle. Like everybody stabbed somebody. Everybody's probably been involved in murders. They can't take it anymore. Mm -hmm. and, and they literally, they just go and they say, I'm, I'm breaking. I'm at my breaking point. It's too violent. You got to just, I'll, I'll play spades with some child molesters. I don't care. Wow. Yeah. But they, I'm not a gangbanger. So it's like, right. I'm like, if all I got to do is fight to stay in the general population, to stay on mainline, like that's all, then let's fade. Yeah. yeah you yeah. know? And you knew how to fight growing up. 
Yeah, yeah we were always getting into street fights. We right. were always getting into bar fights. Like, Portland was not as uh, gay and, <laughs> and hipster back in the yeah. 90s. Like, believe it or not, like, I grew up with, like, a diverse you know, body of people. Like I went to a public school. We were involved in, you know, everybody was like getting into some shit. A lot of people got locked up. I knew a lot of people that got locked up for shit that I was doing. Oh, really? You know, weed trafficking back in the, the early 2000s, the mid 2000s on the West Coast was like crack was to Harlem back in the 80s. It was everybody was getting money. So it was not so unusual uh, what happened to me. You know right. what I'm saying? When I you, mean, I guess it was a little bit, but like we knew a lot of people that got locked up. When you got there, were there people like, bro, what's up? I knew some people from high school. Yeah. Yeah. They were sucked up, though. Nobody there for like real crimes. Junkies. Like, gotcha. it, which was sad. Were they surprised to see you? Yeah, absolutely. What is that conversation? <laughs> They were like, what the fuck? You must have fucked up. <laughs> you were you know kind of I mean? embarrassed? Like, yo, I'm in the same spot as like my degenerate junkie friends. Growing yes, up. absolutely. I was embarrassed in the county jail because I was around such losers. You know, like I had a lot of ego. I'm yeah. like, guys, I'm like a big time criminal. No offense. You know what I'm saying? Like I made hundreds. I made like a million dollars. Like I yeah. should not have to be next to a guy who's withdrawing on heroin. Yeah, he got jammed up for stealing copper. Exactly. Yeah, I, mean, I don't want to be with that guy. Exactly. Not yeah. even copper. Some, a DVD box set. You know, so. Yeah, it, he robbed a red box back in the yeah. day. He's like, I'm taking this, dude. Men in black box. too. Let's yeah. go. Yeah. He robbed the last blockbuster. <laughs> <laughs> so I think that's not even a robbery. That's just fucking foreclosing. Yeah, like, exactly. Yeah, take it. Take Liquidation it. sale. Exactly. <laughs> Literally. So yes, I was I was like, that was part of the brutality of of having to spend so long in the county jail is just being surrounded by everybody they just sco freshly scooped off the street and tossed in there. Yeah. You know what I mean? Which is ninety percent of everybody in like a county or a city jail. Mm -hmm. Right. And then every now and then, you know. You see it, read about this Mexican guy in the paper connected with Sinaloa, right? He got pinched for 50 kilos of heroin, right? And then he comes in, right? But it's it's not many guys like me, right? Right, in you that know? area specifically. Yeah, in that normally, like if I was in a bigger city, because I was getting charged originally with federal criminal charges, I'd be like in New York, I'd be at the MCC, the Metropolitan Correctional Center. Those are all people facing fed time. You know what I mean? Yeah. Portland, it's not. They kind of throw everybody in together. But you never paid anyone in the prison to protect you, even just like, no. yo, no. I'll do favors for you if you protect me. You were you were able to be good. No, fuck no, because it's just like, then what? Then I got to, you know, next thing you know, you know, you're paying, you're giving a guy a butterfinger to watch your back and then you're fucking blowing him. You know what I mean? Yeah, like, uh, yeah, yeah. That's a slippery slope. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That happened yeah. to me in middle school too. Yeah, yeah. I get that. Oh, what? You had to blow a dude? <laughs> yeah. yeah. To it, keep start, getting... it starts with butterfingers. Yeah. Dude. <laughs> and then you got to butter his fingers sometimes. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. That's fucked up. Yeah. And I'm curious, did you ever have a Susie? No. What is that? That's a, that is that a prison bitch. Cost was talking about it. He's like, he was like a Susie in his system was. Uh, a glove with a towel <laughs> and then a sock over it and then a little bit of conditioner in there. That's and you fuck that? Yeah. That we call that on the West Coast a Fifi bag. A Fifi. We oh, call that a Fifi, <laughs> but that's more like you just put rudimentary, you just put a bunch of Vaseline in a glove yeah. and you cut a slit at it and then you fuck it. Why why does it? It's kind of like a rudimentary pocket pussy. I actually got caught fucking a Fifi bag. I did not tell the story on Schultz. I wanted to save this exclusively <laughs> for a you. Mark Camp Camp Let's Gagnon. Go, baby. I was uh I was making love to a Fifi bag. I'm making love. Oh You're no. You're making no. like. You know yeah. what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But I was like taking it easy. You know what I mean? I was like I I was going like semi gentle on her. Yeah, you like that. <laughs> and I was <laughs> and I was turned as per the as per the prison rules, this was in prison, in my cell, okay? Uh, Jimmy was gone. I think he was at, like, medical for a couple of days. Yeah. And so I took that time. Whenever your cellie leaves, that's when you take the time bow, to really bow, get bow, some bow, fucking bow. jerk session in. Yeah. <laughs> you get some fucking you time. You light yeah. some candles, yeah, dude. Yeah, yeah. Make it romantic. You fucking have a little pruno, you know? You get a little twisted. Wait, pruno is, like, basically... It's the prison like, juice. It's oh, the pr fuck. It's the prison booze. So it's literally, like, like uh, fermented prunes or some shit? It's, uh, That's it's a good oranges. Guess. That's a good guess. No, that pruno? is a good guess. It, and it might have come from that, right? At, at my prison, it was just orange peels mixed with so many packets of sugar 
and then they just let that and then a few other ingredients is i don't know i never was involved in making it there was always there'd be always one it was like a trade in prison that seems like very portlandy they're like we're gonna homebrew some beer <laughs> yeah it's like pickling or something yeah, <laughs> yeah. exactly yeah so there yeah. would be those guys this is craft pruno <laughs> <laughs> yeah you're like dude this is amazing yeah yeah a new england pruno i love that yeah so so you but you would buy it you would just buy like bags of it and then you would just twist it up and, and you just would put buy it in your yeah of course oh, yeah fuck. and jimmy like i don't even think i had to buy it like jimmy had the line on pruno cigarettes he knew the guy that had the vineyard and would exactly just, yeah. dude our, our cell looked like a 7-eleven oh. with so many snacks so many fucking uh you know jordan sneakers and because he was the shot caller bro so he would the way he traded for his drugs that he would get in there was like you know commissary items and guards uh, didn't care like or was it all hidden it's hidden and then some guard guards are in on it which we'll get into in a second but uh, let me finish my story about fucking the fifi yeah, bag I like this. so i'm i'm hitting it from the side okay <laughs> because check this out in prison there are literally in the rule book ways to appropriately take care of yourself okay you're supposed to turn with a blanket over you facing the wall and that's how that's how you jerk off right and that's to prevent people from like standing looking through their cells like jacking off looking at the female prison guards or whatever that's against the rules i'm assuming or, exactly. is, that, or is that just like a code thing that, that no no, no that's the rules are you have to turn and face you're at the wall with a blanket over you. That's how you jerk off. And that's a prison rule. That's like, a prison rule. Like from the top down, they're like, hey, if you got to do it. It's written in by some bureaucrat from the state capital. Yes, that's it's so in funny. the rule book. Guys yeah, I was in the like, Congress meeting were like, well, they got to jerk off. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. How are I was, I, I, That guy's a hero. We got to get that guy on the line. Because they're all that's, like, no jerking off the prison. One guy was like, come on. Yeah, all these feminist chicks are like, <laughs> we do not accept this. And a guy's guy like, raises his hand. What if they turn to the side? <laughs> what if they like, kind of like lean like their ass is at? And they're like, all right. So, okay. so, yeah, I was hitting the feet. I wouldn't have a blanket over me. I didn't have some stifling. I needed to... You know what I mean? I was trying to get in there. <laughs> yeah. So I was just I was just smashing the Fifi bag and this female prison guard, this short haired, like butch female prison guard, just I just see her pop her fucking I just see her eyes pop into the window of my cell and I just no, no, no. And it was like the I was embarrassed like my mom had just caught me jerking off. That's so funny. And then she just kept it moving. And then the next day, her next shift, I'm like walking by her towards the yard and I just kind of nodded at her and I go CEO and she smiled at me she goes Mitchell <laughs> <laughs> she knew That's we amazing. had an understanding dude. does that ever happen like I mean it definitely happens but like getting tight with a female CEO and be like yo let's fucking of course of course a, a female CEO who worked in the kitchen one day I saw her getting let out of prison in handcuffs she was fucking an inmate Wow. She was fucking a big black dude. And I don't like stereotypes. You know this, but she was a large white woman. Okay. <laughs> yeah. And I'm like, the fucking jungle fever is so real. <laughs> so, yeah. So she was, and she was obviously like bringing shit in for him. Wow. You know what I mean? So if you, if you are, uh, uh, and, and the burden always, the, the punishment always goes to the person working at the prison. Yeah. That's Cause that's, fair. that's like sexual. They consider that like sexual assault. Yeah. Cause if it's the inverse, like if it's a female prison with a male CEO, then all of us would be like, bro, that's fucked up. Yeah, like fucked. how, how right. dare you? Like right. you're a fucking rapist. Exactly. But as soon as it's a female CEO, we're like, ah, yeah, yeah exactly. I'm like, ah, whatever dude. Yeah. Guy, good for him. Yeah. 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 Uh, but yeah, so that happened. If that, it's just fucking, how bad is the punishment? Do you know? I don't know. I'm curious. Know. Like, cause it seems like the bad part is like, oh, you're bringing shit in. Like there's yeah. a, a break of trust in this whole yeah. system. Yeah. But if you're just like topping off a dude, I don't know exactly. I don't know. But probably what happened is that guy ratted on her. That guy, she started, she started getting out of line, not doing what he wanted, not bringing him stuff in. And so he's just like, probably went to the warden and was like, hey, listen, I got something. What about six months off my sentence? That probably happened. You <laughs> and know he's what like, I mean? prove it. And he's like, yeah. all right, fine. He's like, he's I'll, like, I'll yeah, show yeah. You. <laughs> sniff it. Give a good sniff. <laughs> That's Martha. You <laughs> yeah, know Martha. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Smells like shepherd's pie that we were just making in the kitchen. You know what I mean? So that's, but that's the reason that they don't want female inmates fucking the you know or yeah, female guards fucking the inmates yeah, i mean it's a security risk yeah, you know yeah, yeah. and like escape from danamora that fucking the show about the real prison break from uh you know the prison in upstate new york i didn't see that oh it's amazing with uh, it's with uh benicio del toro and somebody else but it's it's based off a true story that's what's happening this guy is 
this inmate doing life murderer is fucking this female CEO and she's, you know, typical like stereotype, like, uh, you know, her husband works in the prison. They're upstate New York trash. They're, you know, she's depressed. She wants to have like a romp. She wants some excitement in her life. And he manipulates her, gets her to bring in like a saw, a sawzall and smuggle it in. And he is able to uh, like uh, saw through a piece of pipe and escape through like the sewer system, like Andy Dufresne Shawshank style. Oh shit. Yeah. And what year is that roughly? This is recent. It's like it's the last recent? 10 years. Yeah. Escape from Dan Amora. Oh, that's crazy. Yeah. And yeah. then what, do you know the full story? I don't want to ruin this great series. No, it's amazing. Well, curious. no, they, 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 they escaped him and his boy fucking escaped and they were on the run for like a couple of months, but they got him. They ended up killing one of the guys and then they, uh, you know, the rest of the other guy. And then the CEO obviously gets thrown in prison too. Yeah, she does some time. It's not a lot of, you do a couple of years, but I mean. But still, bro, a couple, a couple of years. years. Yeah, I mean, that's crazy. You got to get yeah. a girlfriend in there. It's a whole nightmare. <laughs> yeah, I know. Gotta, I imagine know. having to have a girlfriend for two years, dude, in prison. It's a long Ugh. time. It's a long time to have a girlfriend. <laughs> that's what I'm you saying, know? dude. Damn. Yeah. That's crazy. Yeah. I, that's true love though, if you really think about it. That is like the hottest that is hot. That's hot, yeah, that's, dude. Is that what you were thinking about with your Fifi? Oh, <laughs> yeah, dude. You're like, you're going to get me out of here, baby. Yeah, you're going to fucking, <laughs> oh, we're going to go to Mexico. <laughs> What's up, guys? We're going to take a break really quick because I got to talk to you about a very important issue. I was riding my bike home the other day over the Williamsburg Bridge, like I do, back over to Brooklyn, my hometown. You know what I'm saying? County of Kings. And on my way, right before I left, I was like, yo, I'm going to order a little bit of Uber Eats. Get a little something delivered to the place, right? Here's what happens. As I'm sitting outside my spot, I'm like a block away from my place. I'm pulling up. A delivery guy flies past me, almost knocks me off my bike. I almost fell off my bike. Keep on biking. And I see the delivery guy that almost knocked me off my bike. Guess what? Delivering my food. All the animosity and resentment I had towards him in that moment all went away because I was like, you know what? You almost killed me to bring me my enchiladas. Thank you. Thank you. All of my anger turned to forgiveness. But had I broke my elbow... You know what I could have done? I could have hit up my friends at Morgan & Morgan. That's right. Morgan & Morgan is the largest personal injury law firm in the entire country. Over 100 offices nationwide and more than 800 attorneys that want to hear from you and want to hear your claims. That's right. And now here's the cool thing with Morgan & Morgan. There's two cool things that I love about these guys, all right? Central Florida legends, Morgan & Morgan. Two things that I like. One, submitting a claim. It's about as easy as ordering food from Uber Eats. Yeah. That's how easy it is to submit a claim to Morgan & Morgan. Eight clicks or less, you can submit a claim. It's like buying something on the internet. It's nothing. Submit a claim to them risk-free. Here's the other cool thing. You don't pay a single dollar unless they win your case. Yeah, you heard me right. You don't pay a single penny unless they win your case. You got nothing to lose. If you're injured in an accident, you slipped, you got rear-ended, whatever happened, you could submit a claim to Morgan & Morgan. And if you wanted to do that, you could go to For the People dot com slash gagnon that's correct for the people dot com slash g-a-g-n-o-n or dial pound law that's pound five two nine from your cell phone and that's for the people f-o-r the people dot com slash gagnon or dial pound law pound five two nine from your cell phone if you want to reach out to them if you want to submit a claim now let's get back to the show the whole appeal i feel like neil brennan has a bit about this he's like women love dating a guy that's locked up because they know where he is yes you know what i'm saying yes. like that's the whole beauty of yes. it. It's like you're gonna stay right here right you're not fucking anyone else yep i'm it's you and probably me. it's yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. Hope, yeah. In, inshallah <laughs> but it's you and me yeah and then she's gonna break him out yeah that's crazy yeah oh his exactly. game must be insane yeah oh my god it's it's that's the psych that's the psychopath versus like the confident alpha, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And because she, she got it flipped up. For sure. Oh, that's crazy. Mm -hmm. And then having to explain that to your husband. <sighs> yeah, babe, you're, like, you're going to laugh. She, she, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. but she's like, he's like, just tell me you cheated on me. She's like, well, worse. I, there's now a criminal at large. <laughs> Very large, actually. Yeah, now yeah. That you think about Holy it. Holy shit, they're spending <laughs> so many resources to fucking track this guy down. Yeah, his taxes are going to get my ex yeah. back in prison. <laughs> Fuck. Yeah. Yeah, that's brutal. This is an interesting piece of human psychology. Yeah. Do you think, so obviously like Stanford prison experiment shit, like mm -hmm. you put a bunch of human beings in a room, some are guards, some are prisoners, yeah. like you get this crazy God complex. Yeah. Do you think that female CEOs are more aggressive on average in your yes. experience? Yes. Yes. Because think about it, especially they're from these podunk little deindustrialized, you know, nothing towns, mm -hmm. you know, middle America. And now, you know, they've probably been abused. They've probably 
you know, been with alcoholics and, and, you know, wife beaters and shit yeah. like that. Men have been fucking them over their whole lives. Totally. Yeah. Now they are, are, are getting to tell men what to do. It's like the ultimate dominatrix, right? Yeah. And if you talk back, send your ass to the hole. Damn. Yeah. Not the right hole, the wrong hole. <laughs> right, yeah, exactly. The, the bad yeah. One. Yeah, exactly. So I'd rather be in that hole, you know? <laughs> uh, my, my counselor sent me to the hole one time because I demanded to, to know when my exit date was. My uh, my my date to get the class down to minimum, mm-hmm. and she wouldn't give it to me, and so I and I was trying to like negotiate uh, diplomatically, but like, but you know, legally, like I have to at least have like a, you know, you got to give me like some kind of ballpark date, and she kept saying, oh yeah, keep keep saying that shit, keep saying that shit, I'll send you to the hole. I'm like, you do what you got to do, and she fucking sent me to the hole for three days. Damn. So that's the kind of so yes, of course they love that shit. Damn, that's shitty. Whereas yeah. I feel like the dudes like. I don't like obviously there's a complex that goes along with it but like I feel like they can almost understand like oh yeah you were in the drug game I know people like I feel oh, like there's totally. much more of like uh, understanding you're either you're either really really tough and abusive or you're super cool as a CEO yeah like it's not it's 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 because you got to be really tough because if you're you know a punk if you're like a sh- tiny little you know pipsqueak like this one CEO and you're a shit talker. Well, he ended up getting his ass beat. Yeah. You know what I mean? So you either got to be really big and tough or like just mellow. And I, obviously there's a racial dynamic in prison. Like mm-hmm. people link up in cars and it'll yeah. be like gang affiliated or racial. Yeah. Um, do you find there's a racial dynamic with the CEOs? Like, yeah, would, would like a Dominican CEO be like cooler with the Dominicans and like yeah. vice versa? Oh, most definitely. Most definitely. And in Oregon, it's, you know, we're out in the middle. It's called this town called Umatilla. And it's way out in eastern Oregon. This dusty, like there's like a nuclear reactor that went off, and everybody's got like three eyes. And <laughs> that it's explains fucking it. I was wild. wondering about that. Dude. Exactly, dude. It's just Mongols out there. That's why you're tall. I think <laughs> you went to prison. You were like five nine. No, no, no I, I'm not from there. <laughs> what are you kidding me? I but you were class. in prison there, dude. Are you crazy? Right. You oh, got locked up there right, at a right. growth spurt. That's right. That's what happened, dude. dude. Just no muscle. <laughs> just all bone. <laughs> just yeah. <laughs> so uh, yeah, absolutely. So it's white guys out there. So gotcha. obviously, my celly, Jimmy. You know, he's uh, he's like like, hey, brother, it's like white guy to white guy. Just Hulk good, Hogan's <laughs> good white dude to good white dude. Yeah. Like they, they get the shot callers of the white gangs get on a level with the white CEOs and they're able to manipulate them because it's like, hey, look, you know, we're we're outnumbered here. We, you know, uh, more and more. They're sending more and more blacks out here. We need to really stay strong. You know, how about a thousand dollars to bring me in a drum of tobacco? Right. Whoa. It's hard time. So that's how that's kind of how that goes. Right. Oh, that's crazy. And, and a lot of these people know people from the outside. Right. A lot of these CEOs maybe even grew up with uh, some of these guys. Right. And they're they're one bad decision away from being inmates themselves. Fuck. So, yeah, that, so there's definitely a racial dynamic to it. Yeah. That understanding is is tricky. And is that why Jimmy got like some preferential treatment obviously like being a shot caller like yeah. he was in there a while too yeah he's, he was already in the system 20 years when i was in there with in them. that same system uh no you're not in the same prison but in the same yeah oregon he did time uh they had tried to move him to different states because he was such a a good organizer he was such a problem yeah uh but he'd been in every penitentiary in oregon basically yeah and so he was a legend he had juice guards already respect that and then yeah he just he had the manipulation of like just a psycho like a criminal Mm -hmm. and he was not it was nothing for him to be like you know hey this is this is my cell block are you going to work with me new new ceo or is there going to be a problem you know yeah and it was there one singular guy in the whole prison that like what like really ran it and was it jimmy or no, is it no, not as organized. He as that? ran. He ran like his own car. The for for the uh, the Hell's Angels. Gotcha. And then there was the Aryan Brotherhood, who's not as strong in Oregon. Gotcha. So those are the two white power groups, I would say. Yeah, but the Aryan Brotherhood seems way more uh, Aryan. You yeah, I mean? they're like, intense. They're, yeah, there seems like a way of, like greater racial, hate, hateful dynamic 100, just based 100%. off word alone. I don't know anything about. Well, you know what's fucking weird is that like. There's like in California, they have like Chicanos that run with the Aryans. So it's mm. it's even though like they, you know, they call themselves the Aryan Brotherhood, like it, it weirdly bleeds over sometimes. Yeah. You know, um, you know, the Nazi lowriders, <laughs> lowriders. <laughs> when do you see a Nazi with a lowrider? That's some Mexican Chicano shit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but they're they're not as sure they're they're racially segregated like every other gang. 
but they take prison so fucking seriously. You know what I mean? I'm like, guys, <laughs> what? let's just relax. <laughs> Can't we just yeah. relax? We're, hey, we're playing cards, dude. Like, chill. I remember talking to one of these guys who really had a problem with me playing basketball with the, the blacks, yeah. right? Um, I'd be like, I remember trying to level with him. You ever try to level with a fucking guy doing triple life? <laughs> Never. I'm like, look, dude, <laughs> like we, I got all like f- niche philosophical. I'm like, I know we're locked up in here, but like everybody's got a choice about how we act. You know, man is just the sum of his choices. Do we have to act like animals? And he's just like, what? Yeah, what yeah. You? You're no. like, dude, we're on a rock floating in space. Have you <laughs> yeah. considered the magnitude of eternity? Right. And he's like, I'm going to be in here for that magnitude. You're yeah. Like, oh, yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, no, no. <laughs> and, and, and he considered it, but he was like, well, you know, you're in an adult prison and uh, it just is what it is. And no, I will not break my prison code do you show for your stats? college for your college uh fucking whimsical experiment you didn't show him the stats i feel like if you just showed him like dude i got a triple double last game like are you, right like are you crazy yeah and he's like no you gotta leave it all behind i'm like you want me to play pre-integration basketball <laughs> you want me to play with the whites play yeah. like bob Cousy? Yeah. is this it just like dribbling like this out in front of you yeah just fucking bank in, shot yeah into a peach basket yeah like, no yeah i want to play ball i'm trying yeah. to euro step on these motherfuckers like <laughs> Yeah, yeah dude. That's so up. it was like, um, but yeah, they take prison really seriously. Like <laughs> yeah. they don't fight. They, they, there's no fighting with the Aryan Brotherhood. And did you right? ever have to get a weapon? I mean, yeah, I carried the Jimmy gave me one my first, first day in prison. And what do we was like? This is my shank. So he didn't give me like a bone crusher. What's, that's like a that? piece of that bone crusher is like a piece of steel. That's some shit. That's like either a real knife uh, right where i'm from we called that a piece of steel <laughs> right. yeah, 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 yeah we didn't call it a bone crusher. yeah yeah yeah. we called that a but that a bone crusher was anything like uh wielded from steel or out of like a real uh, from a real knife mm-hmm. he just gave me like a fucking he just gave me something to like carry around uh you know something small easy to carry it was like uh it was like whittled down plastic like really finely whittled down plastic maybe i don't know maybe six inches i'm looking like my, my penis size yeah. I'm like, okay yeah maybe the size of like a the size of a respectable yeah, cock yeah, just an average you know what i mean yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, i wouldn't say it was average i would say it was a respectable yeah, yeah, yeah. upper middle class size uh oh, something proud size size piece you know and, what i mean how are they making these just like out of like shampoo bottles that they like fire down or something um like- i i never heard about that i mean a lot of them were made in the kitchen uh, a lot of them were just toothbrushes whittled down you know what i mean like when the funk was on when it was like beef on the on the cell block, you could fucking hear the next door neighbor like getting his shit ready, right? Like shit like that. So, um, it, it was harder if you had a piece of steel, you had juice mm. because that means you got somebody from the wood shop, right, to you know whittle it down for you. You probably had a guard look the other way while they got it through the metal detector. That was harder. That was going to cost you some money. You know oh, what I mean? Oh wow. Um, so yeah, but everybody else carried around like what they they could make. But you know, you get that in the the brachial artery, you could die still. So yeah, that's a wrap. Yeah, yeah. And so you carried that around. And <clears throat> I carried it around when we went to like we went to the chow hall, uh, showers and shit. Like, um, were you a boots in the shower guy? When when we knew it was time to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We took our boots to the shower. Yeah, yeah. Especially like when when the funk was on. That's when you would you would walk. You take your buddy. And uh, one would stand guard while you showered in there, and then you would switch it up. But everybody had their boots on, butt naked. It looked like black porn in the nineties. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So um, OG mud bone. That exactly. Was, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I'm like, dude, I can fucking really. Get, I get why they yeah, do yeah. this. Do you ever, I can do, get leverage. Do you do that now? You got to. You'd be <laughs> like, fuck I, with boots on. Yeah, I, I learned this trick in prison, babe. <laughs> Get you get bust the Tims out. Well, then I gotta put the I gotta get naked and I gotta put the boots back on. It seems being naked with shoes is a very unique experience. It really is. If, they, if no one's done it, I've done it at home just as a fun game. Pop right. out of the shower, like my Air Max is right there. I'm like, I'll slip these on. Right. You know what I mean? And it feels bizarre. I kind of feel bad for like Monster Energy drink girls. Uh huh. Like, like right. you, you ever see them like at like a promotional event? They gotta be in like a bikini. Oh And then yeah. also like running shoes. Right. I'm That's like, basically it. But you're aerodynamic. Yeah. You're aer- you can fight. <laughs> yeah. You can fuck. Yeah. Yeah. You can you can do a lot. You can run. Yeah, you, you can know? do anything. It's kind of freeing. Yeah, it is a nice. I guess it's a nice feeling. <laughs> it is nice. You get so, grip going. Yeah, yeah. I'm like, I get it, dude. I get why these fellows <laughs> like to fuck with construction tims on. Yeah, dusty and shit. They got residual fuck yeah. juice on it. You're like, geez. All I need are, is a wife beater. Yeah, it doesn't quite fit. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. That's kind of wild. And so, 
That's I'm, how crazy it is, though, because you're expected, you're expected to fight. If we were going to be showering off, and I'm next to a guy from a, of a different race, right, and a, a riot pops off on the yard, we're you're expected to turn and fight wherever you're at. Could be the, the kitchen, could be the fucking showers, could be the baseball field. Would you structure your day around it if you knew the funk was on? Would you be like, yo, I can't play ball today? I I definitely put in more requests to be in the kitchen. Why is the kitchen the spot? The kitchen's the spot because you get fucking unlimited junk food, right? You smuggle out, you know, cookies and we had a really good bakery. So I, you, I could trade people shit for that. Um, it was also like, I don't know, I felt like kind of out of prison almost, right? You could walk around. There was a lot of like freedom to go like, hey, I'm going to go to the, I'm going to go grab the flower. I'm going to go here to like the break area they mm -hmm. had. I don't know. It just kind of felt like. It felt like a shitty job, but at least you're, I don't know, there was some camaraderie there. There's not really a lot of segregation there, so you could be kicking it with people of all different races and, uh, you know, a lot of mellow people. No gangbangers are working there. Oh, really? So, yeah, so you could just be, like, chopping it up with, I don't know, dudes that are, like, making plans for the future. Yeah, yeah, you were you just on your, on your kitchen nightmare shit. You're like, right. dude, we got to make... We got to make these souffles. We got to get it going. But you know what? I was still shitty at it. The Mexicans, <laughs> my nickname in there in the prison kitchen was Pedazoso. Lazy. <laughs> Lazy. So I would walk into the dish That's pit. That's a way worse insult. Like, uh, at least gringo is just descriptive. Yeah, but, bro. like, lazy is like, yo, I'm not doing shit. I'd be walking into the fucking the dish pit where yeah. we'd all be on, like, a dish line. And you would just hear, Pedazoso. Oh, si, sí, viene Pedazoso. Uh, but that's not fair. Like, everyone compared to Mexicans is lazy. That's what I'm saying. Yeah, I mean, like, like, you guys, I'm not lazy. You guys just work way too hard yeah i'm like guys you're making a dollar a day <laughs> and they'd be like that's where we're from it's a lot yeah yeah, yeah. We're, we're making money yeah. i actually came to prison to kind of as a level up <laughs> yeah. yeah i make 50 cents in el salvador <laughs> this, I'm, this is the american dream bro that's so funny you never think about that like yeah. if you're getting paid in prison and you come from like a third world country yeah. you're making decent money yeah, right? yeah like, it might have been more than that it might have been like a dollar an hour wow so they're actually maybe that's like yeah we we're making maybe like seven bucks a day the oh, minimum that's... in Mexico, forget about like El Salvador. In Mexico, the minimum per day, el mínimo, is six dollars. Wow! So I'm making above minimum wage. Yeah, that's interesting. so that DUI I got actually turned out to be good because <laughs> now here I am, got a raise. Yeah. yeah, exactly, dude. That's wild. Yeah, and with the kitchen <clears throat> shit, like that was were you given jobs like were you able to be there all the time or did you have to like do like janitorial shit half the time no i that's like orderlies we call that an orderly yeah how do the orderlies work those are just like uh the guys that are like mopping the fucking cell tiers passing out towels and shit and you never did that i never did that those guys can make a lot of money or or live well because they're the dudes that are like smuggling shit because they're pushing the, the book carts around to different cell blocks. So if I'm Jimmy and I need to get, uh, you know, I need to get a shank, a burner, we called it, to a different cell block, uh, you know, I give it to an orderly and then he gets taken care of. Uh, you know what I mean? So those are a little more, those are for more senior inmates. Oh, gosh. Right? So orderly. Was you can't just get a good job in prison. Like right. you have to like start, you know, doing something shitty. But orderly is a good job. Yeah. Oh, that's cool. And then yeah. kitchen's like kind of mid range. Like Yeah, I would say kitchen is mid um, and then the whatever, worst job, the worst job is just a, anything with the child molesters. You know what I mean? Like the PC unit. Like I would consider that the worst because you're around like real scum. Yeah. Um, but like, but I feel like those guys are the least threatening. Like these guys are cowards. They're like, yeah, that's ultimate losers. Right. Yeah. Like, that's true. I guess, I guess on principle, you just kind of like shudder. Like when you hear like, like, you know, yeah, this guy murdered children. Yeah. This guy killed, a, kids, this guy killed, this guy killed his grandma with a, with a, a lamp. Like you heard that shit. Yeah, fuck like, that. Oh my god. Yeah. But I don't know. Maybe kitchen might have been the worst job. Kitchen might have been laundry, laundry room. I don't know. It just kind of depends. I hate it all, right? Yeah. Well, you want to fold <laughs> yeah, yeah. fucking shitty underpants? Crazy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, I guess folding. Some would say, like folding laundry was better. Yeah. But I would say working in the kitchen is better. I don't want to. I don't want to fold somebody's drawers. And then with you know Jimmy, I mean? obviously being your boy, you you were like smuggling stuff for him. Yeah. Yeah. I did at the beginning. How bad? is that first experience smuggling stuff because were you smuggling like cheeks yeah yeah how yeah. how like it, it was it was terrifying even though he assured me he was like this guard is our friend so you're not gonna have any problems you're just gonna walk this to the kitchen because you're and, working in the kitchen and right? so we're talking like rubber glove <clears throat> contraband thrown in there like drugs or something yeah, it was a balloon it's a balloon literally of drugs. A balloon. yeah it's literally it's a tiny little fucking balloon 
How and, did they get balloons? Just the same way they got the drugs? Like uh, they balloon it up. <sighs> that's a great question. Um, I, mean, I if don't you can get, know. If you can get heroin in there, I'm probably, probably yeah. Get that, some that's balloons. what I mean. Well, a lot of them are reused too. You know what I mean? So if if you, there's a balloon, so think about that. So you're sharing fucking doo doo germs with somebody else, right? Like that. How wild is that? So if if uh, you're my old lady, I'm I'm an inmate, and you smuggle me in a balloon of weed, like probably that's gonna get traded around. Oh, the same balloon. Not wild. You never so, think about that. Yeah. So, um, so yeah. And, and Jimmy was like, you don't have to keister this. Our guard is working. But you were like, I got it. <laughs> I'm like, I got to do this for the story, dude. I'm going to be on a podcast someday. <laughs> but I was so fucking terrified. I'm going to like, but it wouldn't have mattered. Like if I get strip searched, they're going to see a balloon fall out of my ass. You know what I mean? It was either that or swallow it. But so, you don't want to swallow someone else's shit balloon. Right. Well, you know, I'm sure it was cleaned off, Mark. But like, yeah, but still, how yeah. clean can shit be? And, and I don't want to like swallow. I'm scared to like swallow a balloon. You yeah, know what I mean? Like, I don't know how long that's going to. Small gonna, intestine. And then you got to like move that through. It your, breaks open. It was very just, small. Right. But like yeah. still, like I, I'm like, yeah. So I fucking you get the little the little balloony end to stick out. It's like a tampon. And you just fucking shove that up your fucking uh you know brown brown eye now up until this point i'm 26 mm -hmm. i've never had anything well uh i'd never had anything in my in my asshole yeah i've showered thoroughly and yeah like I've, that's pretty much the extent of it but the most is like a finger like a your like own finger the tip up of there. a finger kind yeah. of vibe you know what i mean i've just never explored it maybe if you're asking if, if it feels good i mean fantastic is more <laughs> the word <laughs> He's like, dude, put it in your pocket. And you're like, what pocket? Yeah. Like, I'm, it's going in yeah. my main oh, pocket. It, oh, it's in the pocket. Yeah. Don't worry, dude. But like, is there an expl? Is like, is there a conversation? Because that is a, a on the outside world a fairly gay experience. Nobody, like, nobody talks about it like it's gay. In there, right. nobody it's, talks it's about it like business. It's gay. But like, does he explain it to you? Like, hey, if you need to move something, do it in your ass. And then you're like, well, how do I get it up there? And like, does he give you like it's a called demo? Keystring. Does is there a demo for keystring? Or is no, it just you like, kind of got to learn as you go. You kind of got to learn as you go, but it's like, I put it's like the, jerking off. You just kind of discover it on exactly, your own. exactly. But you're like, you're either going to keister it, or he goes, you don't have to keister this. You can just walk it there. And I'm like, uh, I want to keister. I'm just, I'm paranoid. You know so what I mean? What's the first time you keister? Like, like, are, what's going through your head? Like, what is the feeling? In like, literally, like, uh, it's it's a mix of like terror with just concentration. It felt like being back, moving, fucking fifty pounds on the highway, right? Oh, really? So it's it's adrenaline. It's like Let's focus. But I feel like We're that would get tighten. There. That would tighten up the sphincter. Uh, sure, you know sure. The shit like, shoot. Yeah, yeah. Like yeah. That, I feel like that would lock me up. I'd be like, oh, fuck. I got to think of something different. Yeah, but you know, I mean, you you do it before lunch, right? Um, and you actually. Yeah, I did it before lunch, so I hadn't eaten. Do you lose right? it? Uh, I put a little mayo on it. We had some mayo packets. <laughs> oh, dude. Yeah, and spread it around. <laughs> And uh, does anyone running, tell you mayo, or are you just like I'm gonna just do this uh, my way? I'm, I'm gonna do this my. This is my you journey. Used spit, dude. Yeah, I suppose so. But I was <laughs> my mouth was dry. I'm t I'm, t I'm scared. You know, my I had no spittle. <laughs> I, mean, I could have used the Vaseline for my fifi. Yeah, you had a fifi, <laughs> I had dude. A fifi. I don't know. So, but I had. I, you know. You Who knows mayo. what goes through a young man's mind? <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah. we know what goes through his ass. This fucking yeah, yeah. <laughs> egg deposit. That yeah. is wild. Yeah, and so, just so a, a little bit of mayo, and you go on your bunk, and yeah. you throw the blanket on. Yep. Yeah. And then you just kind of no, like... No, 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 I didn't do it in my bunk. I did it in the bathroom. Okay. Yeah, so you go into the stall, and you fucking, you know, you get it, you lube it up, lube it up with the mayo, my Have little you, fucking any, this, keister sandwich. This is a personal question. Yeah. Have you ever done a keister sandwich outside of prison like before this like you're no, with a girl no i don't even like shit that's what's wild is like i don't like any ass play even with my chick or yeah. you know like a colombian fingertip. hooker like i just don't fingertip yeah fingertip ring the doorbell fingertip one time. yeah right. no. exactly exactly yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah but like consider that a balloon a drug it's not like it's, it's not a water balloon fight this is a very small like it's really they they take two grams of meth and they ground it down to something that's just a little bigger then your pinky, oh, right? That's not bad. So it's like they they get a lot in there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's it's it wasn't like um, you know, it wasn't like a super, uh, you know, I didn't have to like uh, you know, jam it up there. I didn't have to tink 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 <laughs> tink. You know, <laughs> yeah, make a statue. I got it in David. there. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> wet. exactly. But you like when when it was in, you knew it was in. Yeah, 
Yeah, I'm like, okay, it's in there. I can get it out. Because that's the other fear. Like, you know, I've seen stories, not personally, that like a guy will like be playing with a dildo or some shit or like lose it in his ass. Yeah, yeah. Oh my God. You talk to anybody who works in an emergency room, it's it's gunshots and dildos. (laughs) Yeah, I would take a gunshot any day of the week. Like 50 (laughs) Cent got respected after taking eight shots. But imagine he has eight dildos in his ass. Like he falls off the face of the map. He's not a rapper anymore. If I got a dildo stuck in my ass, I'd be like, somebody shoot me. (laughs) And I could say I got shot and then the guy rammed it up. Yeah, exactly. Ass. That's a way better story. I would do that. Self-inflicted. They're like, dude, the bullet was right against you and the gun's in your name. You're like, look, it was a freak uh, accident. Dude. But yeah, that's just like, and you were never afraid of losing. You're like, as long as the tip is out. I'm yeah, good. yeah, exactly. But honestly, like you could just shit that out. Like you just, you just eat and there's enough pressure. So then you walk it down. Yeah. How long is the walk? Like the walk is like from our cell block to the kitchen was maybe like an eight minute walk. Okay. It's the other side of the prison. So you kind of squeak your way over. Yeah, I'm like, I'm like, just don't come, don't come. If you come, you're gay. Don't. Do that. Yeah. You're just Brock hard the whole time. Yeah, yeah. You're like, see you, <laughs> my lady. I get there, I'm like sweating. I'm like, who's got a cigarette? <laughs> yeah, I gotta chill, dude. They're like, Fifi time, you're like better. And then you get there, and yep. then how does it come out? You go to the bathroom. You just fucking, you give a little squeeze. Bam! I got the end of it right there. Boom. Bloop. Wash it off, and then I know the guy that I'm giving it to. And then you can just pass it to him. Exactly. Whoa. Yep. So I did that a couple, several times, (laughs) several times. Next time I use ketchup. (laughs) I did that a couple, several, many, every day. I did it every day. Yeah. That sucks. But I quit doing it. Jimmy quit have, quit having me put in work for him when he knew that like I had a date to get class down to minimum and I was already like doing stand up in these, you know, talent show nights that they were having. Yeah. And I, and I was like writing scripts like by candlelight in the middle of the night. I would just be like writing. Oh, you're doing furiously. Uh, I was I writing scripts and I didn't know you were doing scripts. I thought it was just stand up. No, I was doing stand up, but I didn't think stand up was <clears throat> a viable thing you could even do. Like I didn't grow up watching like Mitch Hedberg. Right. Or watching Tosh, Daniel Tosh on like, you know, late night Comedy Central. Yeah. I knew three comedians. I knew the rock stars. I knew Chris Rock. I knew Dave Chappelle. And I knew Cat Williams. Nice. Like those. So I'm like, you have to be black and you <laughs> yeah. have to be like a rock star. You have to have this like wild charisma. Yeah, stadium like, shit. Like yeah, how do I, I sell at a stadium? Yeah, exactly. I'm like, okay, I, I didn't even think I knew about Louis. You know wow. what I mean? Louis C.K. So I didn't just, I stand up was just not a part of my life growing up. But I was like, oh, but this is like a fun, it's a fun like performance and I can be an actor and I could, I could write scripts. Like I'm a good writer. I could be a screenwriter. They need this. This is something that Hollywood as a business needs. They need people to write these stories. So I was always like money and logic always drove what I did first, not like the art of it. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Like whatever is practical, I could do. So I was like, okay, I can really move and sell a script. I can move to Hollywood and I could sell a script. Hmm. You and know what, what was I mean? the script you were writing when you were in there? I think it was just like a crime story, like involved, like it involved shit about my own life. Sure. But like, you know, I threw in like New York and it was like a fictional, like dramatization, to- totally a thing. fictional dramatization. I, dr- I wrote like five of them. Right. Yeah, and they yeah. never saw the light of day. Right. right. Who, who knows? Who cares? It, it never had a shot. Right. But it was just like, it was just like a passion of mine. It became like an obsession. So Jimmy saw that and I told him like, I'm going to go, I think I'm going to go, I'm going to move to LA. I'm going to go, I'm going to try to be in show business. And he, and like he got it and he saw me killing one night at the talent show doing stand up, just roasting different gangs, different cars and sets. Right. And, uh, and he was like, okay. He's like, yeah. All right. Well, you're not going to carry around a shank anymore. You're not going to fucking, you're not going to keister anything for me anymore. Like, I'm, yeah, you got to be clean cause you got to get out of here. Mm. You know what I mean? That's so cool. That he yeah. looked out for you like that. Yeah. Cause I think he had reached a point knowing he lost all his appeals he knew he was going to die in there. He'd, he'd almost like reached this like spiritual level where he was like, okay, I'm going to, uh, you know, accept my fate. Yeah. I'm going to quit being a bad person, quit gangbanging to the extent that I can mm-hmm. and like do what's right. Yeah. And do what's right by somebody else. Yeah. You know what I mean? How much does reform like that happen? Like to me, prison doesn't seem like a place for rehabilitation. No, right? it's, it's not. like a holding cell for criminals to either get better at crime <laughs> or to like stay there forever, or, like mm-hmm. get out. Like 
what is the like the relapse rate? What's the word for that? Not recidivism. Really. Yeah, recidivism. It's like, high. Recidivism rate is insanely high yeah. in America. Like it's not really for reform. But no. every now and again you hear a story of a dude that's like like when we had Koss on, he was like, Bro, I went to prison, I started reading the Bible. Like yeah. I learned like this way to live that was completely foreign to anything I'd ever done. Yeah. And it like really changed my life. Yeah. Did, like how, did you see that at all? Like, yeah, I mean, uh, yes. I don't know how many people like put that into practice once they got out, but yeah, in there you see people that have reached like a uh, maturity and an understanding, uh, and a sense of self and an education that they would not have gotten if they were still on the street yeah. running. Right. So it does force you to sit down and just be with yourself contemplate so it's kind of up to you what you do with it right you know what i mean did you have that moment like obviously like you're writing and being contemplative but mm -hmm. did you have were you in there long enough to be like yo i gotta change my ways like i have to be like a better person i have to, I like feeling guilt for any of the people like maybe you fucked over anything i like didn't that. feel that until i got out mm -hmm. i was still like in an adrenaline mindset even in prison where i was like i gotta fucking I got to make this new career work. I got to get the money back that they took from me. It was mm. still like very selfish and almost like a victim mentality, right? Um, but when I got out and I saw my dad crying for the first time, and I told this on Flagrant, yeah. you know, I'd never seen him emit any kind of emotion like that. He's a very absent, you know, cold Midwest father. And when I saw him cry, like breaking down, bawling, and he was crying into my shoulder like he was my son. Yeah. I was like, ah, oh, that really hit me. I'm like, God, I fucked up. Like, mm. I can't I can't do this to them. If if not for me, then for them, I, you know, I can't go back. Yeah. And how was the like patching up that relationship with your parents, like with your dad specifically? Yeah. I mean, I think it just kind of happened over time by just my action. Like they could see like I really was like serious about, you know, changing my life like doing this crazy move to LA, like trying to be in show business. Um, and then it just, you know, over time, right? They quit worrying, you know, as the years went on, you know, and they saw my progression and stand up. Mm -hmm. uh, that's just kind of how they, we were all able to move on, you know? Everybody got older. Right, do you feel like the, the relationship is bonded like fully? Do you feel like there's still more work to be done? Um, I don't know, I don't, think so i don't think so i mean i think my dad is like you know my parents are in their 70s they're at their, that age where like they're like you guys do you you know mm -hmm. what i mean like you know short of like going back to prison like we're happy with everything that you're you're doing you yeah. know what i mean so i really had like a good childhood yeah. like i really really beat going to prison i really beat the odds <laughs> you know yeah. like really i mean Nobody in there had ever been to college. Like I was like, just, just having gone to college, I was like in the 0.1% of inmates, but to have two parents yeah, that like gave a shit, it's like low. unheard of. What do you think it was like fully contemplative, like fully like psychoanalyzing yourself? What do you think the motivation was to behave in that way? Like you could have made money a, a myriad mm -hmm. of ways. Mm -hmm. Like you could have had a ton of different careers that probably would have given you the same high. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Like, I'm not sure though. I mean, the like, high was a huge part of it. Mm -hmm. The identity was the big part of it. Like, it was, what were you battling internally that was like, yo, this is what I want to do, and this is the way I'm going to make money and live my life? Yeah. Well, it was, as I said, like building an identity for myself, right? It was uh, not wanting to have a real job, like seeing my parents, like, you know, they did well, they were middle class people, but they fucking, at the end of the day, they were exhausted and overworked. And I found it horribly uninteresting, right? Just the kind of middle class, like doldrums. Like, there's no story here. Yeah. I've always been obsessed with story. I'm like, what's the story of your life and yeah. identity? And so you kind of build that. And then that coupled with opportunity. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And then, dude, listening to, you know, being that white kid in the 90s, you know, growing up revering hip hop, black, ghetto culture, and the aspirations of Jay Z. And mm. at 50 Cent and these people who are not really gangsters. Their their rap is aspirational. Right. It's the gangster story of, you know, coming from nothing and making your street money and then going legit. Right. That just kind of that built its that uh, I built that kind of narrative for my own life as I got older and I progressed in the drug game. Yeah, you that's know? interesting. I, I remember that feeling <clears throat> like in Orlando 
not knowing anyone that did anything cool mm -hmm. not knowing anyone that did anything like like there were people with a lot of money and like i grew up in communities that had money yeah but it was always like oh i own you know a real estate company yeah. i own an insurance thing like yeah so the only people with money had boring jobs that they didn't really like yeah and then there was a lot of people with no money that had boring jobs they didn't like right and right I was like damn like yeah you know if, if like money is the only delineator here and obviously having a lot of money is better than having no money yeah but like just having a job you hate just sucks. I remember that moment, like asking people in my family who as a kid, like I have all these older siblings. I have five older siblings, wow. one younger sister. So like everyone in my family is like living their life, making money, doing jobs, whatever. And I remember just as a kid, you just assume everyone likes what they do. And I remember right. being like 13, 14 and like asking people in my family, like, do you like your job? And them looking at me saying, no. <laughs> and I was like, what? Yeah. Like this whole time you're going to work every day. Like you're working hard, like fucking killing yourself and you don't like it. And it like terrified me and also blew my mind. Like, mm -hmm. yo, you can do people I know that I really love and respect are doing things they don't like. And I always thought work was that way. Mm. Like I always looked at that like, oh, this is why it's work. Right. Like from a young, from seven years old, I was like, I want to play in the NBA because mm -hmm. that's money. That's freedom. That's not work. Yeah even though it's work, it's mm -hmm. a career. You know what I mean? So it went from that to drugs. Mm. And then it went from drugs to show business. So it's literally living the Cameron album, sec, uh, sports, <laughs> drugs, or entertainment, SDE. Yeah. Like that was the only, it wasn't enough just to make money. Yeah, You had to make money in a cool way. You had to make money in that entrepreneurial way. And I think if I was raised, if I was a kid now, if I was 20 now, this, I would be having a totally different life path because yeah, the there's so many ways that you have access to so many different ways Fucking to make money. TikTok. I, exactly. <laughs> I would literally just be like doing something, you know, start an e-commerce business. Nah, I would, nah, nah. I would you'd, you'd be like a fuck boy asking people questions on the street. You 100%, think so? <laughs> 100%. At 20. And then you would do an e-commerce business when you're Hey, what's up, man? Can I ask you a question? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. daughter, gay son. Like yeah. that would be you at like 19 and then right. you would evolve out of it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, right. But I agree. I think there's a lot of those kids that like, yeah, they see a couple different paths and they see ways. And now that entertainment is kind of democratized. Yeah. That is like a viable way. Yeah. Whereas in your time, even fucking 10 years ago, yeah. it was not an option. Yeah. Yeah. Which is kind of crazy to think about. But I remember that feeling being like, yo, I don't know anyone doing anything cool. And the idea of trying to do entertainment was just like, like my, my dad and people in my family just being like, bro, work is a thing you have to do that no one likes. Mm. And just yep. being like paralyzed by that idea yeah like, and so i was always trying to like hedge my bet like mm -hmm. yo, i'm gonna do entertainment but like keep it professional mm -hmm. so i was like intern at the laugh factory yeah where i was yeah, like yeah, yeah. i'm gonna be as close to the thing as possible but never fully jump in you are very responsible you are very Too responsible you are a very hard <laughs> worker you're a very like you know you're you're a lot of ways you're by the book like you really yeah. you see how it's supposed to be done and you do it very well. Yeah, that's true. You know what I mean? Like you see what needs to be done. I'm trying to do that less. Low you key. get a lot of you get a lot of that from Drew. You yeah, get a lot yeah. of that from Andrew Schultz. Yeah, for sure. I mean, um, he's like the master of this like strategy, like understanding what to do, coupled with like yeah. fucking you know, generational talent. Maybe like, you don't always want to make a thumbnail with a goofy face, <laughs> but like that's yeah. what is happening now. Yeah, exactly. You know what I mean? Yeah. So and I I said this on Flagrant. I'm like, you just work with what you have in the times, the uh, the historical times that you exist, yeah. right? Like if this were the 80s, we'd have shoulder pads on and we'd be like doing, uh, you know, observational <laughs> humor about the subway yeah. at these comedy clubs, right? Yeah. And it would be dope as fuck, but that's just not, that's not the reality anymore. I can't be a Coke kingpin. Mm -hmm. There is no more kingpin. You know what I mean? The what drug mean? business has been flattened. Wait, why? Because there's so many different drugs, because there's, uh, because nobody's a kingpin anymore. Unless, unless you're, you know, one of the three cartels in Mexico, hmm. because there's, you know, there's just a, there's less demand overall. There's more demand for drugs. There's less demand for one kind of drug. Really? For sure. For yeah, sure. I guess that makes it like back in the day, it was like <coughs> heroin, weed, coke, slash crack. Those are the good days. Those yeah. are the good old days in the eighties when unique existed, yeah. right? Now everybody wants fentanyl and fucking synthetic weed. And, and yes, there's coke, heroin, but heroin's cut up with fentanyl. It's like. It's just, you know, it's, I just use drugs as an example of like, well, you just have to make, make do with what you have. Mm -hmm. That's why I sold weed. Cause like, that's what was working. Yeah. You know, and I got very lucky. Yeah. And this might be a stupid question, but like, were you not responsible as a kid? 
I was not a troublemaker, but I was not responsible. I was a liar. I was a fucking, it was all rebellion against my father, to be honest with you. Hmm. But I was, Despite yeah. there not being any animosity towards him. Now there isn't, but no, back then he was, he was a very like verbally abusive person, sometimes physically abusive, you know, old school, whack you across the head. Yeah. And that's, that's what got me lying. Mm. It started with dishonesty, right? And so I would, I've discovered that lying could get you out of trouble. Mm. So it just progressed. And then I would get caught lying and he would get more mad at me and get more distrustful of me and get more kind of like disappointed in me. Were you religious at all growing up? Nah, you know, Catholic until everybody drops out sixth grade or whatever. Yeah, but that you know idea I mean? of like, don't lie was not like ingrained in you. In no, any significant way. No, 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 no. I never, I never thought God was watching when I fucking jerked off or keistered a drug balloon. Oh, that's so funny. I'm you, the exact opposite. You always I'm, think I'm God's the watching. First time jerking off, just like crying. <laughs> Literally, like, like there was like a like the when I discovered jerking off, and then like for two months after that, being like. Oh my God, what am I doing? Like, how could I do like literally yeah. like having like emotional breakdowns mm -hmm. of like mm -hmm. the, uh, the, yeah, like this moralistic guilt coupled with it. Yeah. I don't, ha I think you have a personality type that is like inherently like, uh, like conflict based almost like, I, I feel like you are like, you're not like, there's like agreeable and disagreeable personality mm -hmm. types. And I don't think that you are like overly agreeable just as like a, like a matter of course mm -hmm. coupled with a parent that is like aggressive you're like, no, fuck you. Whereas yeah. like I, my parents were not aggressive, but like had I had an aggressive parent, I think I would have been more likely to capitulate. Whereas yeah. you were like, nah. Yeah, I'm going to go, I'm going to retreat into my world and my environment and fuck you and I'm never going to come back and see you. I'm never going to visit you. Yeah. He was a real shitty parent, right. you know, just strategically, <laughs> like, like he did everything wrong. Yeah. You know what I mean? Um, did it change your mindset on like parenting or having kids? Yeah, I didn't want any of it back then. Oh, really? I'm like, oh my God, this fucking God, you got to bang this fucking ball and chain mom. Every day, you know? whatever. Yeah, yeah. Right. I don't think he was fucking her every day, dude. <laughs> <laughs> Not that yeah. cheapskate. But, um, you know, and just like, man, it's just the life is just, it felt like prison. Hmm. Every day is the same, right? And that, you know, obviously like as a little kid, it was you know, you're just joyous, but mm -hmm. like, yeah, starting from like fifth grade on, I'm like, I gotta, I gotta, it's gotta do something different. You know, Did I gotta get out like of this town. That disagreeability. Is that fair to say? I don't want to like, yeah, put yeah, labels I would on say so. Yet. No, no, no. I like that. But like, do you think that that is, uh, do you ever, did you ever feel like that was wrong? Like, did you ever think like, man, why am I this way that if someone tells me to do something, I don't want to do it? Um, yeah, I, but I wouldn't think about it in those terms. I'd be like, how could you be so stupid? How'd you get caught? Hmm. So it was a real lack of character that I had mm -hmm. that I had to that I was forced to like uh, when I went to prison that I was forced to confront and it was like a stunted like there was some uh, stunting of growth I would say in, yeah. a, in a lot of ways. Yeah. And I wonder if you had like been put into some type of program early, like not literally like a program but like mm. like re you were playing basketball and stuff. Growing yeah. Up. Like were the teams giving you senses? not even team sports because I wanted to score all the points. <laughs> it's always been about me, 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 me. You know, yeah. I've always been like I had that stand up comic personality mm -hmm. where it's like we could win. But if I didn't go for like 25, then I was pissed off. Yeah, you, lost. you know what I mean? You exactly. personally lost. Exactly. And that, that's not a great mentality for yeah. team sports. That's why I love tennis, kid. though. Like my dad saw that he got me to tennis because it's like this is this is all me. I loved I loved, I never, I abhorred groupthink. Mm. You know what I mean? Right. Like, I don't even like being in groups now. I don't like, you know, having big groups of friends. I always did back in the day because Portland was such a tight-knit community and I'm grateful for that, but they, they get exhausting to me. So, yeah. you know, I always felt like I had to break out, break out of the pack. I was always that guy. And for you, do, how much of that do you think was nature versus nurture? Like, did the family environment make you more like staunchly individualistic or did you yourself... Just find yourself being that way off That's rip. That's such a great question. I think it was. I think it was off rip, man. I mm -hmm. think it was. You know, obviously, nurture is, is a big part. Of, it like molds who you are from nature, mm -hmm. right? Um, but yeah, I've always naturally been uh, contrarian. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And what have you done like since prison now? Because obviously, that personality type can get you far in some capacities but also like really hinder you in other capacities mm -hmm. what kind of like things have you implemented to try to be like 
you know, more of like, quote unquote, a team player, be more like collaborative and things well, like that. Because you I've, seem collaborative now. Like you're, you're helping me with this show. You like link me up with Unique. Like you seem very forthcoming and giving. It was a book I read because I have a big reader. It was a book I read called The Science of Getting Rich. Read this book. <laughs> it's like a hundred pages. Yeah. And it was but written, the title of it is exactly something that like young Johnny would be looking for. Of like, course. I'm going to get rich. And I read Fuck it, everyone. I'm going to get rich. And I, but the book is completely the opposite of fuck everyone. Mm -hmm. That was the whole thing. It was written like 120 years ago. Like, remember, you know, the book Think and Grow Rich? Yeah, yeah. That's, again, a book written by one of these guys in like the 1920s. And one of the main premises of the book was move from competition, move your mind from competition to creation. Like there's enough, there's enough for everybody. Yes, you may not be able to get rich selling coal. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Not a lot of people using coal anymore. Yeah, yeah, you Santa, might... that's pretty much it. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, green, the green energy is yeah, fucking yeah. Santa. Yeah. You know what I mean? <laughs> uh, but you can get rich somehow mm -hmm. if you create and you provide value. You charge a man less than what your product uh, is valued for, mm -hmm. right? My my product, my podcast is worth five bucks, but you only have to pay one ninety nine for Patreon or whatever. You know what I mean? So when I when I moved my mind from competition to creation, that changed everything. It changed things. It changed the way I I interacted with comedians and show business and power dynamics. It's helped me let go of ego, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and it's you know it's I, I don't know my career is moving now yeah it's better off with yeah it. i'm yeah. doing better i'm taking off yeah which i yeah i completely understand the other side of it i think <clears throat> i am sort of the opposite in a lot of ways like i think growing up very religious instilled a lot of that in me where like it was always like give give more than you have yeah. like if you only have five bucks give six like amazing fucking find a way to do it amazing and in ways i almost get insecure because i feel like it holds me back where i'm like if i was more of a narcissist I can just fuck everyone and just go for it. But I'm like, I think because of a really religious upbringing that like for me, probably just the way I am naturally, like I don't necessarily have that. I have to like consciously be like, oh, I'm going to turn down helping someone to do something for myself. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Whereas like almost going the other way, which it seems like kind of you have, which is like a little bit more like self-centered, selfish as a kid mm -hmm. and then learning like, yo, let's be more collaborative. Let's help people a lot, which you've done. I, I guess it maybe it gets you to the same place, but that way almost feels... I don't know. I'm curious what you think. Is it easier, you think, like yeah. to go from like, I okay, I'm, I'm in my world and I'm going to open it up versus like, okay, I got to focus on me. Yeah, it's weird, right? Because you think about the dirtiest, most narcissistic business, politics, Yeah. right? How do I ascend the political ladder? That seems like if you're selfless at all, you're, you're going to be fucked, right? Mm -hmm. You always need to be Conniving. doing stuff for yeah. people as long as it's going to come back to you, yeah, I hate right? That. <laughs> so we would not that. do well. So I think I think that's just not for us, yeah. right? You do what's for you. Mm -hmm. Everybody does what's for you. You do what you're good at and you do what uh, you're just pushed towards doing, right? And then you'll end up where you're at as long as you can accept it. Yeah. If you wanted to be in politics, like and you couldn't not. accept that you're not in po you're not built for politics yeah, I'm not. you'd have a miserable life yeah how many people are in stand-up comedy not meant to be in show business yeah probably a lot <laughs> almost exclusively right <laughs> yeah, yeah so but they just can't accept everybody's got a talent but you have to be you have to accept it mm -hmm. so yeah that's interesting i think uh i mean what that's the better the way you were raised is just it's such a better way to be it just you just avoid you just you avoid so much just inner hell Mm -hmm. by having an operating system that is giving first. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I didn't go to prison. So I guess. Yeah, <laughs> but how did you how did you get like that? Was it your religion or was it your parents? I think both. I think also being in a big family, like it's inherently yeah. collaborative. Like yeah. everyone's kind of doing something. You yeah. know, I, I had my orderlies. Yeah, you know? So yeah. like, even as a kid, it was just that. And then, yeah, I really think it was religion. I don't know. I, I think partially just kind of the way I am. Were you, were you, poor or like lower middle class no my family did well like we had a lot of siblings so it like the money would be distributed so like yeah. i got a car from like my brother when he didn't need it anymore but that's I had how a car. we did it yeah that's how we did it yeah but it was like a minivan 
Mm-hmm. That yeah. was souped up. Took Minivan all, was fat, though, bro. Took all the seats out that, of it. Really? Yeah, oh, of course. Bro, Immediately. That's, that's the under bucket. Yeah, yeah, That's yeah. some shit you drive home 240 ounces deep. Dude, it was the best. And you just fly by a cop and yeah, he doesn't yeah. even look. Honda Odyssey. I would like. I had yeah. lights in it. I had the couch in the back. I got a <laughs> mini couch from like a kid that was in college. Put it in the back seat. You're and like then, an old black guy named Earl. Bro, here's the old best part. Old black guys got vans, And dude. then I leveled up for the van. Guess what car I got next? Chrysler 300. Yes. Yeah. Oh my God, dude. Wow. But it, but it was always that kind of shit where like. You were pure South Florida But garbage. I loved going, uh, for real. I loved going to parties. And so I would like go to these house parties in like an abandoned house or like a house that's for sale that mm-hmm. some kid kicked the lock in and like yeah. everyone's going crazy. There's like 300 kids just like getting shit faced, but I wouldn't drink. Yeah. So I was always hedging. Whereas like, okay, we're going to go to this thing. Like my friends would be dealing weed out of the apartment mm-hmm. and I'd be around, but I would never touch it. I'd never smoked. What did you, what was your thought process like getting into stand up comedy? Like, how did you end up working with this kind of operation? And it's like, are you thinking, you must be thinking practically. Yeah. You're like, I'm going to go to New York. I mean, it's a big step. You're in the big city, yeah. New York City. I'm going to survive this way and uh, at the same time doing stand up over here. Yeah. But like, stand up was always strategic. So, like, I loved it as a kid. I was like obsessed with it. Mm-hmm. And it was like a way that, like, me and my parents really bonded. Like, oh, wow. my, my dad, his dream was always to be a comic. Uh, he always wanted to be a stand up comic since he was like little. Do you ever know this when <laughs> the pussy stink? <laughs> yeah, literally. And like, my dad is like a South Florida, like, he's from Montreal, but like, he's a South Florida guy. I didn't even realize it until we went to Miami. But like, his whole day, he's like doing phone calls, lays out in the sun, mm-hmm. works out, gets a huge pump. Like, he's just like a, he's a Cuban. He's a Cuban, yeah, you know what yeah, I'm saying? Yeah. But like, but he loves stand up. And so would always like my first like iPod, the first album on there is like Jim Gaffigan and Seinfeld. Yeah. Or like, that's like the, it was just stand up on the, mm-hmm. on my iPod. Mm-hmm. And so I'm just listening to it over and over. Like that was the only thing on. And then we would like drive to like math competitions when I'm in elementary school and I would recite the entire album. Wow. Like front to back. And then like I would drive to soccer tournaments with my mom. And Laugh USA was on like Sirius XM or whatever, mm-hmm. and it would just be playing nonstop. That was yeah. the only thing we listened to. And so it was just like instilled as a kid, but then it was always hedging because I never knew anyone that did stand up. Right. Like I knew one guy that did open mics that I would like DM on Facebook, like uh-huh. Facebook Messenger, like, hey man, can I do open mics? Yeah. But it was always strategic, always hedging. And then I was just like doing it a bunch like through college and then linked up with Schultz, just like opened for him on a show. Yeah. And then like kind of gave him a spiel, like, hey, give me a shot. And yeah. like, if it doesn't work out, that's cool, but like, yeah. let me just like sell merch for you or something, mm-hmm. and like, and in trade, like, can I open some of the shows? Like, let me host. Let me do five minutes, and uh, it just became like a perfect pairing. And right. obviously, he's just the best, and like took care yeah. of me and like mentored me through the whole thing. Yeah. So I got really lucky in that regard. Uh, but, but do was, you think in your mind? Hedging. Do you think in your mind like uh, maybe I won't make it? So here's like the yeah, fallback. Always. That's how I think I, all I think the time. That now. Yeah. Same. <laughs> like, I'm like, Absolutely. I'm, I'm yeah. like, okay, what if I'm like, you know, is there? Can I be an insurance guy? Like, mm-hmm. if, yeah. I, if I say like dick sucking too much, will that affect like this other thing? You know what I'm mm. saying? Like, so yeah, I'm always in that mode of like. So I hedging. think that will be your arc. That will be, that will be your little obstacle, your little uh, mountain oh, to climb. Hundred percent is to when like you believing in yourself. Yeah. To the level where you're like, oh. uh, yeah, no, no, next year is going to be better than this year and the year after that. I'm yeah. about to be to the moon. And I'm a little stupidly optimistic with that stuff where like things are going great and I'm like really happy and like this show is awesome. Even if no one watches it, I would do this every day. Like just connecting with human mm-hmm. beings is like my favorite thing on the planet. Mm-hmm. But yeah, it's it's still like I remember having a moment like maybe two years ago, kind of like what I call like my face tattoo moment mm-hmm. where I was like, I got the face tattoo. Like, like, uh, proverbially yeah. speaking, yeah. like I'm not going back to yeah. a regular life. Like right. the idea of just like having a nine to five is off the table. So now it's only recently that that's happened kind of for me, which seems kind of crazy maybe for someone that's like doing open mics in Orlando, still seeing where I was at being like, bro, like you've already face tattooed a while ago. Yeah. Like, you're going to be fine. Yeah. But in the back of my mind, it's still scarcity. Like I got to be good. Yeah. But yeah, it's always collaborative. It's always like if anyone needs help with whatever, I, I enjoy that. And mm-hmm. I think that's a, a Christian value that I got. You hang love. on to that. You yeah. hang on to that. Um, but when you listen to real bosses, there's never like, there's never a doubt. They're mm-hmm. like, this is what I'm going to do and, because the business will be there. Yeah. So that kind of mindset is just so rare that I really believe it, man. And, and the drug game taught me that if yeah. it were not for the drug game, I couldn't, I probably wouldn't have, that entrepreneur's mind because Mm. I literally thought it was started with a thought when I was 16 years old 
and me and Reggie, we can say his name because we forgot to bleep it on flagrant. And he's like, it's fine, dude. <laughs> yeah. We copped our first ounce of weed and we fucked the bag up and, you know, we end up smoking it and, you know, we owed a guy money. We owed the fucking drug dealer money now. But I, I was like, we're going to be fucking huge. Like, we're going to be like, we're going to be drug kingpins. Yeah. And it was just such an insane thought. Like, how could a, a guy from a middle class Portland, Oregon, you have no criminal connections. Like, you don't even know people to buy this shit. Yeah. But just like, just, just embedding that in my mind and never, it was always in my subconscious, right? Like uh, six years later, I'm, I'm making 50 grand a week sometimes more pushing moving pot all over the country yeah i mean with dominicans in washington heights negotiating prices like do you think that could have gotten beat out of you had you got like fast tracked into like some nine to five like you know you're let's say you start interning when you're 18 and then you're just like working at a finance firm yeah like could that have been beaten out no. of you? like that's no. what i'm saying so i don't know if the drug game even taught you it or if it made it you just realize what was internally in you you know what i'm saying right like I feel like you would have done that regardless. Like sure, sure, but it was it was a way for me to see that like you can bring into creation what you think about, like mm -hmm. what the Bible says: "What man thinketh, he become." Mm -hmm. You know, and that's really like I was like, "Wow, okay, so if I could do this, I can apply this to something else." Mm -hmm. So yeah, yeah I'm, I'm like, if it hadn't been drugs, like if you came up now and you found out like this crypto shit or something, yeah. like if, if someone just was like, "Hey, do you want to sell Amway?" Like, right. I feel, I wonder if you would have just gone into that track and then become an entrepreneur in some other capacity. If I could see that there was money in it. Yeah. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. Like, if yeah, you yeah. just had a mentor yeah. that was a businessman that had like an interesting entrepreneurial kind of job. Yeah. If you would have been like, all right, yeah, I can fucking make money and get my high through this. Drugs just happened to be the first thing that came on your lap. When oh, you were for 16. sure. For sure. If there was something that I could do where just like drugs, there's really no barrier to entry. There's mm -hmm. no business license. Cause I'm not like that. I'm not organized. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? Uh, this is just like purely capitalistic thing, trading fucking, you know, Forex currency, whatever, you know, these little 18 year olds that are look, looking at screens all day do. Yeah. Yeah. As long as I can see that there's money in it, mm -hmm. like I'd be at that, you yeah. know? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And so, yeah, you just like high risk. Yes. Like you like, like gambling. <laughs> but yes. do, you, do you gamble gamble but i'm not a gambler though that's what's wild is like i take calculated risks mm -hmm. it's not i'm not like a lot of these cats you know famously that uh make uh, millions of dollars but that all goes out the door you know gambling on like higher and higher and higher stakes mm -hmm. what i did was a calculated risk it was a thing that just formed on accident right me really like seeing that i was like oh shit i'm about to make millions mm-hmm Right. Like I was like, oh, it's on yeah. when I met the buyers on the East Coast and I found out what they were going to pay f per unit. Right. And I was like, oh, just quick math. I'm like, that is that's 100 grand a month. Easy, like like on an average month. Oh, I'm about to become rich. Has the like, desire to for... me. That was like that was like uh, I knew a Brinks truck was backing up yeah, yeah, to yeah, unload. Yeah, yeah. I'm like, that's just a I'm about I'm going to go get it. Yeah. And look. It's 50 50 but if i get if if i fail i'm i'm gonna have to sit down i has knew that, i was gonna have to go to prison that's shaking it all for you like the insatiable desire for money yeah somewhat like as you've gotten money like you've had like different amounts of yeah. crazy money in your yeah. life like uh, like has that faded at all um yes because you know i got it too quick and you really don't appreciate it when you get it that quick mm -hmm. and that because it becomes like a fake number especially in cash. Yeah. You're like, you just almost forget about the money. Unique was talking about that too. When you get so much money, you're weighing it. Like it just becomes, <laughs> yeah. it's just paper that gets stashed and hidden and loses value. Yeah. Like you don't, I had no respect for money. Mm -hmm. uh, now, you know, making uh 10 grand doing online shit uh, feels like making a hundred grand in the drug game, right? Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Because in my mind, again, growing up, the idea, like money was, almost, there was almost like a, like it was a good thing to have, but it was almost like a dirty thing. Mm. Like it's very middle class. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's very like, middle class. Never, Jewish people don't talk about money that way. Yeah, Jewish people love talking about money. Yeah, yeah they'll yeah. talk about it with aunts and uncles. They're yeah. open with it. That's why they're so good with it. Mm -hmm. They're like, what? Everybody's got to have it. Yeah. So yeah. let's just talk about it. The idea was always just have enough and then shut your mouth. Yes, exactly. And like help people when you can, but like don't like. What is the point of like talking with money being extremely ostentatious? Like, yes. So it, right. So it wasn't hard for me to shake that idea of like money, 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 like. It never was a big motivator. And yeah. 
so I've always been of the mind that like money is not going to make me happy. I saw a lot of people with money. Like I went to a very wealthy school mm. where like I went to Rollins College in Orlando. It's like the it's extremely expensive. Tuition's fucking insane. And I'm going to school with kids that are like flying private back home oh. to like go to, you know, dinners with like their dad who's an attorney for a president, like that kind of shit. And how miserable they were hmm. early on. I almost had the opposite thing where like, I didn't have any money, like had a decent living growing up, but like just seeing all these people with money that were fucking dying. Right. Like OD, like yeah. the head of like some insurance company that just fucking kills himself. Oh, wow. And I was like, oh, like just having a lot of money is not a good MO in right. general. And so for me, that's, it's always been a motivation to have enough. That's like a bare minimum, but it wow. was never like I need to get, like I, even at this very moment, as I sit here, I don't have this elute, like this grand idea of like, oh, I'm going to make, 20 million mm. that's i don't think that's gonna happen okay well or may, maybe it will I, like I, again i don't think it will or won't but like i don't have this like burning desire to get that you don't have kids though either yet no so you know you have a kid and then then the the panic will be on but then i'm curious too because like all my siblings have kids like i have 15 nieces and nephews wow and i'm almost like we all know this spoiled rich kid and having a ton of money is not good for kids either right so i'm like as long as i have enough for them that's and true. I can go move to like a mountain somewhere. Yeah. And have like a little like polite living, but still be able to do the dream and like connect with people and do yeah. stand up. Yeah. That would be enough. That's pretty dope. That's Which is, dope. I think, a healthy mindset. But mm -hmm. at the same time, I do think it's like sometimes a hindrance to like, quote unquote, greatness. I think I think you got to shoot for the moon. Yeah. And then you come come a little short. That's all right. But that You're moon for there. me is not financial. Yeah. Like, I'm curious, like, as you've made more and more money and like you're making great money now, like. I wonder if it's shifted or how do you think it'll shift more as uh, you're like, yo, what if I have slightly less money, but like I get to work this hour out and like this joke is better yes, or like my yes. show is better. Even if it makes me this percent I, less, I would rather have a well oiled business mm -hmm. than make the most amount of profit. Mm -hmm. I would actually rather have it be more passive, mm -hmm. right? Just like I would take less money off of the each pound off the brick if it meant somebody else was driving and going to pick it up. Yeah. And you know, that's the calculation. Just, yeah. That's the calculation. So I would much rather have, uh, something that's, uh, a machine and, and spread the wealth around than you know, have to work as hard as I'm working just to make the money that I'm making. Right. Yeah. So yes, I'd rather the goal of course is to connect with people doing stand up. Like I, I really just want to be able to kill. Mm -hmm. Right. Yes, I want to be able to kill. I want to. I don't figure want you to feel like I'm like baiting you into the question. No, be like, no, no, no. Art is better than these are. Money. These are good questions. But like, but I would not kill. There'd be no motivation to kill if there weren't a financial uh, goal attached to it. Like, I really, I, I've been thinking about this lately. I'm like, yes, stand up. I don't know. I may end up quitting stand up. <laughs> to be honest with you, like for sure, like there's there's a level like maybe at like the twenty year mark, mm -hmm. like if I've put out two killer fucking hours on YouTube, yeah, and I got a podcast like this or something like that, right? I've sold some shows. Um, I feel like I got one of the coolest fucking shows, which yeah, I'm proud of. You yeah. know what I mean? Like I'm really really proud of it. So when I feel like oh, I'm scared to like spend the money that's going to take to go down to Columbia. I'm like, wait a minute, dude. This is once in a fucking lifetime. You know what, what I mean? What if go you win the lottery? Let's say you make literally $500 million. Oh, that'd be terrible. Oh. I'd never want to win the lottery. Are you kidding me? But, but let's say hypothetically that happened. You have a great aunt that dies and she's the president of some fucking... Right. You know, she leaves me a half a B. Literally, yeah, $500 million. Yeah, I mean, I would, I would make the coolest shit you know what i mean i'd make all the television that doesn't get made anymore mm -hmm. i'd make the movies that can't get made because of you know all of these factors that we know about mm -hmm. so yeah that's what i do i just you know i would just make as much art as possible and how much would you not work um because that's a lot of work making yeah stuff yeah, work. yeah yeah no, no no i think i think that would be like the rest of my life you know yeah. i would i would be I would be supervising the script and everybody else would have a duty and I would just be the creative. Yeah. I would just be like, you know, the guy sitting behind the desk paying actresses or, you know, promising actresses jobs just so they blow them. You know <laughs> yeah, what I mean? Fire, dude. Yeah. The yeah. dream. Fuck yeah, yeah. dude. For the dream. <laughs> like, who do you think has the best life? Oh. Like, like, if there's a guy you could trade lives with right now, who do you think that is? The best life. Yeah. The best like life is the guy who's really who's really content mm -hmm. the best life is the guy that you probably never hear about mm -hmm. you know what i mean 
It's the guy. My dad's got a pretty great life. Yeah. Because his ambitions were only to leave Cleveland, Ohio. Yeah. And as he's grown out of like the midlife crisis that he was having back in those days that caused him to be such a dick to his family, he's now like he's got a boat and he's going to go up to the San Juan Islands up in northern Canada and he's just going to be a loner and he just loves it. He loves the beauty, he loves looking at whales. I mean, that's truly it. And when you're in prison, when I was in prison, I could reach some of those moments sometimes where the funk was off, nobody was beefing. Everybody got their drug fix, so everybody was mellow. Um, I'm not thinking about, oh, how am I gonna, how am I gonna make it in L.A. Right, mourning the loss of like money. Yeah. Right. That was ba basically not even mine to begin with. Yeah. I was like, man, I'm just sitting here chilling. This is really fucking nice. Yeah. You know, because there's no, there's no, and that's why people get institutionalized because you're just like, I'm living for the day. Mm. There's really no. Um, um, the state is taking care of me. And there's a lot of structure. These yeah. Are organized. That's what exactly. Andre, Andre was saying that. He's like, when I got out of prison, there would be a few, a couple, like a week or two later, he would drive to the top of the mountain where he could see the prison and he would just sit in his car and look at it. Yeah. And long for the days that he could just be kind of taken care of. Life was structured. Things were organized. Yeah. And, and, and it was kind of simple. Everything made sense. Yeah. Simplicity. Yeah. So mm. knowing that though, like that's what I'm constantly trying to balance. Mm -hmm. Like I love that moment of just like, you know, contemplation, like free chill. Yeah. Like, like the idea of having a bunch of kids and just living in a fucking ranch somewhere. Yeah. So and, how do you get to where Andre, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. How do you get to that without actually having to be in prison? That's what I'm trying to balance. Yeah. And then also like the massive ambitions that I have mm -hmm. balancing that with like, will those make me happy? And mm -hmm. oftentimes I'm like, the more money I have to a point won't make me happier. Like, all this like you know success or fame or whatever things mm -hmm. come along with being great at a, a task or a, a job yeah those i don't think will make me happy i think no. like having kids being connected to my family like getting off the grid and being able to do podcasts and stand up yeah that'll that would make that'll me make you happy yeah so, the stand up shit the show business won't make you happy so i knowing that as a 26 year old i'm like okay how do i balance and i'm curious mm -hmm. like what your journey with that is knowing that like those kind of like the complacency is kind of happiness, but you're not a complacent human being. Yeah, I haven't figured it out, Mark. Yeah. I don't know yet. I don't know. I'm really just kind of, I'm taking everything as it comes. Yeah. And I'm, I'm, and that includes my work, my, 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 my spiritual work. Yeah. So I don't know yet. There's mm -hmm. a lot of, I'm like 10 years older than you, but like I'm five years younger than you. You know what I mean? <laughs> I'm just way behind. You know what I mean? I'm just a late bloomer. Yeah. But blooming late is great. Yeah. Like slow down, young man. You know what I mean? <laughs> like you're doing you're married already. Like like take your fucking time. Life is so long. Life is way too long. But that was one of the reasons why I wasn't hooking up and fucking all these chicks. Yeah. Cuz I was like I'd seen that in high school and like yeah. random hooks up with hookups with girls. I was like, "Oh, this may this is like sugar. Like mm -hmm. this made me feel really good in a very small amount of time mm -hmm. and I could see the writing on the wall of like, oh, this pursuit of like small fixes, kind of like sometimes manipulating a girl and telling you you love her, but you don't actually to yeah. like get her to hook up with you. Yeah. Like the scumbag shit is hurting other people, kind of deteriorating me emotionally and spiritually because it's not actually nourishing me. It's making me feel good for a very short period of time. And then I'm looking for the next hit. Mm -hmm. Whereas if I can find like a real nourishing human being to like mm -hmm. build a life with, I'm like, oh, that is going to make me way happier. And so far it has. Like, How long have you been married? Like Theory, almost three years. And have did you hook up in high school? Is that what you're trying to tell me? Did you ever get laid? Have you ever fucked anybody else besides your no, wife? Just my wife. So you're like Jeremiah Watkins. Do you yeah, know that yeah, comedian? Yeah, yeah. Same thing. Yeah, exactly. Right? Yeah. So but yeah. Ample opportunity. Yeah. But again, like it, when I was hooking up with other girls, it was like it was really unfulfilling. Mm hmm Yeah. And, and I could see that being like, oh, this is a a drug mm -hmm. and I, it, I can see how that is not good so i was like yo let me just build a life now i found an awesome girl and she's great and i could build a life yeah and like that to me is is nourishing so well, me like, and you are not the same my <laughs> man me and you are not the same um because i'm only now getting off the streets yeah. when it comes to pussy the same reason i i, I was you know had to take and taken off the streets with drugs i'm just running out of wind yeah, yeah you know yeah, what yeah. i mean i'm just getting tired yeah but you can fuck girls without doing any of this shit like you could just chill at your house and just hook up with girls like have you found it to be less fulfilling as time has gone of on? of course of course that's why you're like yeah i mean it was tough because like i started getting better and better women you know as i get older and older which mm -hmm. is that what's that's what they don't tell you you know what i mean the <laughs> yeah. less your dick works the more chicks want it you know yeah, what i mean yeah. it's <laughs> fucking weird so but um 
well, that's good. But, you know, then, yeah, then just take it for what it is and then keep it moving just day after day. Yeah. Take it day for day. Yeah. You know? Yeah. I, I, I do. I get paranoid about it, though. In about the, what? In, like the complacency versus the ambition in the way that you were talking about. No, no, no. Ambition is today. Yeah. You know? Folk, today there's there's enough to do today mm -hmm. you know what i mean that's why war and being in prison it's like i just gotta survive today yeah you know what i mean like i gotta get this fucking drug balloon unnecessarily <laughs> shoved in my ass i gotta get this to the kitchen yeah. without catching another case like that's i got enough to worry about yeah so you got enough to do today and the presence is nice yeah because and then you'll just see how fast you grow when you take care of today's tasks you ever meditate yeah, I like got it? into it in prison. Oh, cool. Yeah, and I've and I've sometimes I fall off. Like right now, I'm in a I'm in a fall off period because this fucking YouTube shit's cracking. So I'm like, fuck you, God, yeah, suck yeah. my dick. Yeah, <laughs> yeah fucking. Yeah. But uh, yeah, no, no, no. Meditation changed my life. Really? Yeah. In what in what capacity? In just kind of like what I'm describing to you, like being able to live, uh, being free when you're doing it in the process, but then also achieving uh residual peace of mind and clarity you know for however long that lasts you know i'm of the belief that when i manifest and i can't calculate it but i'm of the belief if i'm really uh meditating and manifesting every day that lasts like three to six months oh yeah seriously like what you think about now you will see manifest at the end of this year 100 percent. i completely believe that yeah and the, the tricky thing, though, is that so many of my friends that are doing this are manifesting things that they don't want. Really? <laughs> Where, like, they'll manifest money. Mm. Or they'll manifest, like, women. Uh-huh. And then they get yeah. the thing they've always wanted, and then they hate themselves more. Wow. <laughs> From, like, Interesting. How, like, how do you manifest, like, a I family? manifest numbers. Right. I manifest numbers. Mm -hmm. That's what I do. I don't put the dollar amount on it. I yeah. say, we're going to get this many subscribers, this many views. This is going to allow me to get this mm -hmm. like stand because I know that'll all bring in money because the goal is a family. Yeah. Like the whole goal, the whole thing we're doing here is just to get enough money to fucking raise some kids and then die. No, that's but, not your goal. No, that is my goal. Your goal is trying to get the fucking bag. Yeah, of, of course. <laughs> but uh, but but the bag, all that is, is is being too obsessed with survival. Right. Because I just want a huge bag. It's all just survival. Mm -hmm. Like this huge giant metal building we're in, yeah. that's just a, an, a the epitome of surviving. You know what I'm mm -hmm. saying? Because we come from, you know, uh, uh, deer skin in front of our loins <laughs> and fires yeah. and just staying out of the rain. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So that's, it's it's just mega survival. Mm -hmm. And so you, I, you think you want to have kids now? You definitely, most definitely. Hundred percent. And what do you have? Like, I've always wanted that. But you were saying before, like when you were younger, you're like, yo, kids. But I'm just like, how is it ever gonna? Ha Deep down, I always was loved the idea of love. But I'm like, how is that ever really gonna happen? I d I never believed it. I never hmm. believed it. So I'm like, yeah, the idea of being in love. Yeah, exactly. I, oh. I was. It was totally foreign. Totally. Uh, totally something that I didn't experience till much later than most people because I had all this drug money. Hmm. You know what I mean? I had all this. I'm like, how can I share a, a, this with a partner? You know mm -hmm. what I mean? I did, gotta... did it make you happy, all the drug money? No. At a certain point, no. Now, the fucking, the adrenaline was sick, though. You right. know what I mean? Taking fucking jets in Colombia, that was sick, mm -hmm. right? Like, that was, it felt like it was a roller coaster that I'll never feel again. Yeah. You know what I mean? Even, like, killing in front of a packed crowd, it didn't really, it doesn't really compare to the the, the feeling of beating society because when you sell drugs and get away with it when you move pounds across the country and yeah. it gets there successfully yeah suck it and, rudy giuliani <laughs> exactly thousands <laughs> yeah. of people thousands would of unseen the invisible hand of the free market conspiring was, against were, you no sucking up my drugs oh i see that's yeah, yeah, power yeah. the government's I just conspiring beat, against you exactly you but i just them. beat them yeah this hand right yeah yeah of course long term the house will win yeah but i beat them it's really hard to match that yeah can I have one of those? Yeah, have you have you done these before? No, no, I've never done these. Before. I hope you don't throw up. Do you? Um, oh, you have oh to there lie. is nicotine in them. It's only nicotine. Uh, like, like, after this, I'm gonna walk around as the sun's going down, just smoking weed. Like to me, New York is a perfect happiness. Like the way that you want to go 
out to the woods and raise a bunch of kids, yeah. you know, and feed them goat milk and have an Amish wife. Yeah, exactly. You know, literally. Yeah. You nailed that. Yeah. 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 <laughs> you want to be like a Mennonite. You know what I mean? Uh, drive a horse and buggy. Those people are happy. That's yeah. I think those people are probably happy. <laughs> well, some of them are the right. fucking women don't look happy. Yeah, no, no, no. They they're, look they're pale miserable. and yeah, yeah, yeah. gross. And my wife is miserable too. Yeah. But I'm happy. Yeah. yeah <laughs> You're I'm really not. happy though. <laughs> yeah. So that's me walking around like New York and hmm. I've been here. I can't tell you how many times I've been in New York, spent time in New York, but like when I'm on the plane coming from wherever I'm coming and I hate flying and when I see those fucking city lights still like it makes me almost start weeping. So I'm like, oh, at least I get to see her again. Oh, wow. That's that's what New York City is to me. Would you move here? I would. I would. But part of me is like, God, I don't know if it would kill that like specialness I, I have for it that, mm. you know, she's like an affair, right? Yeah. She's like an affair with like an older Latin woman who just like strokes you and takes care of you and like answers questions. Yeah. Like, oh, you want to get married? Well, like, you you love this girl. <laughs> you love her. Like, like, you are my blessing, you know? Yeah, like, yeah. But you come back and fuck me, you know? <laughs> well, you got too old to fuck. Yeah. You can't. That's the thing I like about New York is the humanity. I like being around people. Yeah. Like, that would be the ideal setup is like someplace like 30 minutes away. Yeah. 10 acres. Mm-hmm. And then all the most interesting, coolest people in the world can come hang out with me. Yeah. And then I get to drive in and do spots. Right. And then go back out. Well, there's plenty of land, dude. You go get it, man. I'm so close. You'll get that. I'm dude. so close to literally just like 45 minutes out, try to get some acres, and then just put like a motorhome. Wow. Like a nice one. Like a nice RV. You're that guy that's oh. going to have a motorhome no matter how much money you have. You're Bro. still not going to be able to get away from it's the swamp. It's dude. always the minivan, dude. Oh, you I'm make just me always sick. trying to be in the minivan. Oh, you make me sick. Are these making me sick? <laughs> Let's go. Yeah, you, you thought, make me sick. You Wait, it was no. me. You're like, <laughs> no, I'm hiccuping now off this. You feel a little buzz going? I feel not? fine. Do you want water? Can I get a water? <laughs> yeah. Now I'm buzzing. <laughs> Let's go. Now I'm buzzing, bro. Let's go, Johnny. See, it's like when you do shrooms. Yeah. For the first hour, have you ever done, ever done shrooms? I haven't actually. You should do shrooms. You want to be out on all those acres? I feel like I am shrooms. You should a do. You are shrooms, bro. <laughs> I'm shocked you haven't done them. Yeah, but I Why am. Not? I'm going to. I'm going to. But it has to be the right setting. I'm trying to like Thank set you, my intentions for it. I don't want to like party. I, I like to use drugs to inform my sobriety. You know what I'm saying? Like I did Molly at Burning Man. That was mm. awesome. That was so fun. And then I was just telling. That was my, a good trip my, for you guys. Oh, it's the best. And I'm going back this year. I'm so excited. But like my jaw was going crazy. I was telling everyone I loved them. And I was with all these people I love. I was with Schultz and Dove and the whole crew. And I was just like, man, I love you guys. And I, I wasn't faking it. I was saying yeah. how I actually felt. Yeah. And then three days later, I, I never had a sad come down. I was never depressed. I just called yeah. my mom and I was like, hey, mom, I love you so much. Yeah. And I should tell you more. Mm -hmm. And so I'm using Molly to try to inform how I feel when I'm sober. So that's a perfect way to use psychedelics. Mm. I, I, when I do shrooms, I never let my brain go fully, just fully let go. How many grams are you done? When you start off, when first time, just do two grams. Yeah. You'll be nice yeah you'll be frying you'll be you'll be you'll be fucked up okay but you're not going to be hallucinating you're not going to be seeing things you're not gonna be talking to god it's a body high mm -hmm. it's a body high first because it's poison right it's, it's Good. mushrooms coursing through i'm gonna get rid of these hiccups in a sec <laughs> um maybe you should do them alone yeah you should probably just do them alone because mm -hmm. you you might puke i puked when i used to first start doing shrooms in college because your defense mechanism is you're gonna want to throw this poison up yeah so you'll throw up and then you'll feel incredible mm -hmm. and then you'll be then you'll be like okay i'm good yeah just don't panic yeah so anything do not panic yeah you're not dying i've gotten anxious on weed before we're like I'll but smoke. you know you're not gonna die no 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 weed. but i'm just like oh, i need to go home and go to sleep like mm -hmm. i don't want to be around these people anymore i gotta mm -hmm. get out of here mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you won't feel like that way on shrooms oh, really yeah probably not Okay. Yeah. yeah, I know, and I know in my conscience, I'm like, no one's ever died on shrooms. It's impossible to overdose on this. Like, yeah. Worst case scenario, you're just having a crazy trip. Yeah, but and like, you're gonna get them from somebody who's got good shrooms. So yeah. you're not gonna get anything. You're not gonna get need a liver transplant. You're gonna be fine. Yeah. You know what I mean? But I would do them. Yeah. I would do them. You're gay, you're gay if you don't. I, that's what I'm saying. I'm going honestly, to. you're fucking gay. Kind of bothered. It doesn't bother me. That you <laughs> fucked one woman, even though that is just insane. But the fact that you haven't done shrooms is a little. It's. Settle down, Mitchell. Yeah, you got to get a grip, dude. You're judging me for not doing shrooms. You can't even control a hiccup. You can't even do a zin. You can't even. I do can't a, even do a zin, yeah, bro. Yeah, he's like, dude, come on, do a heroin. What's happened to me, bro? Fucking do some fucking blow. <laughs> but um, 
But yeah, I'm curious, like when you do shrooms, are you never like, oh, this money stuff is dumb. Like we can like get enough and like, let me achieve my dreams. But like, yes, no, no, I, I don't think this money stuff. It's not that I'm dumb. Like the money stuff is dumb. I'm like, oh, you're fine. Mm -hmm. It's not like things are going to be okay. It's like things are okay. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. So the the real fucking mindset is like your boss, yeah. Andy Schultz. Yeah. That motherfucker is not afraid to spend. Yeah. You know what I mean? He spends because it's like, I know I'm getting it back. I yeah. know I'm getting it back. And if this all goes belly up, it doesn't matter. I get the next thing. Yeah. I think about that with my show, you know, like I get haters in the comments. I'm like, you think this is all I got? This is just the fucking tip. Yeah. Wait till I put the whole shaft in. You know what I mean? See, that's how I feel. But I hedge it with other life shit where I'm like, so like even just like the cams and all this stuff it was like a decent investment for me. I was like, okay. You Are know, these your cameras? Yeah. yeah. Oh, wow. And so I was like, yeah, this is like. It is a decent investment. It, so I was like, yeah, it's a you know little chunk of change. But I'm like, <laughs> if all this goes belly up and this thing doesn't work, I will do a different thing. Yeah. And if even if that doesn't work, I'm just going to keep trying until I die. Yeah. That ultimately, and connecting with humans and doing cool shit and stand up is the only thing I really care about. Yeah. And, if, and if that doesn't make any money, that's kind of okay. Yeah. Because ultimately, I know that my happiness is going to be with my kids and my family on the ranch. So, and that's what, but that all comes from your mind. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So, like, trying things will be fine. And, and just knowing that is hedging. Mm -hmm. You don't have to hedge as practically as you do, you do if you hedge your own mind be like mm -hmm. it doesn't matter because like i have a woman who loves me and i am connected and, and i'm living day day to day you yeah. know what i mean yeah and that's so. kind of how i feel where i'm like i don't have this thought that like oh if this fails i know we we're talking about it before like if this fails like everything's <sighs> over i'm just right. like there's it's impossible for it to fail because i'm not going to quit yes you know what i'm saying like Very failure true. like implies finality like you can only fail if you stop but like some people should stop, though. <laughs> Not stop living. Yeah. Shouldn't kill yourself. Yeah. But some people, if if nothing's working in a particular space, it's probably not for you. You know what I mean? This is my thing, though, <laughs> with that same idea. Is like, there will be people that will do stand-up, and they're not that good at it. But, like, they're in their own little lane. And it's funny, and I agree. I'm like, bro, quit. What the fuck are you doing? You're, like, hogging up the space, whatever. <laughs> right. But really, the way I feel is, like, bro, if you love it, and you're, like, got your own little club, and you're torn, and you got your own little fan base. Like, For sure. Even if you're not doing even if, like, you're just doing fucking kind of, like, you're just doing spots in the city that are fine. Right. And you're happy, and it works. I'm like, yeah, go. Who the fuck am I to tell I, you? Not I to? guess I look at like the misery of doing that. If they're miserable, yeah, yeah. And, and there think, are a lot of people. I think that a lot are of people like that. that are like that. Yeah, you yeah. know what I mean. Uh, the, the caveat you, of that is misery. Yeah, for sure. But if you're bliss and you're just like fucking kind of smoking, yeah, and making some paintings, and like you're able to get money through yeah. something, fucking do that forever. Right. But or if it's stand up, it's like it's hard to not want to be part of like the cool guy club, like you know Rogan and you know yeah. the whole fucking podcast cartel, but. You know, there's a lot of money just online. You could just build your own lane. That's what I'm saying. And it's like you don't. It's almost better. It's almost better. That's how I feel. Like, yeah, it is cool to be a part of the club. But like, I also feel like obviously through Schultz, like he's the fucking coolest motherfucker. Yeah. And I am a part of the club, and that's yeah. awesome. And I'm like, yeah, that's great. And but maybe you see, at the end of the day, like everybody, the ironic thing is when you break into that club, you're like, oh, it's not that cool. But yeah. So you were saying with the parenting thing. Yes. So when I have kids mm -hmm. and I fully intend on having kids, hopefully they're daughters, right? Because fucking, Why? I don't know, because daughters, A, they're not inclined to antisocial behavior, right? Mm -hmm. Just, it's just the truth, right? Men are statistically, scientifically more aggressive, yeah. more inclined to be antisocial. Yeah, we're more, more pro-social. That makes sense. Whatever I have, boys, girls, he, she, they, thems, whatever it is they're not going to be raised with the scarcity mindset that I grew up with, mm -hmm. right? Because even though we were middle class, we didn't want for anything. We grew up in a house that we owned. The, all we heard was we could be out on the street. We have one bad month and we're homeless. You know what I mean? Mm. There was just, there was a lack of gratitude for what we had. And it was a constant from the top down, from my father down to the kids. I, you have to work and you have to make money and it's so hard to make money and it's a big, scary world. And... Those people that are wealthy, they're that way. They're ordained that way. We're not like that. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And it's like uh, that. That's just a fear-based way of thinking. And and truthfully, it, it's what made me want to sell drugs. Yeah. 
you know, like that was part of it. It was like survival and, and, you know, it's misplaced survival, right? But st nevertheless, that, uh, is a corrosive way to think. Yeah. And the, so yeah. the inverse can also be as a, as corrosive. So how do you balance that? Have you thought about that? Like, well, what is the inverse? Like having so much, having anything that you want, but that's ever. not a, that's not a mindset though. But it is, uh, it is uh, to an extent, like if you have everything and you're like, man, nothing really feels like anything because I'm not struggling at all. Like we know as humans biologically, like labor work in yeah. some capacity to get an outcome feels good. Yes. Like fucking totally. build a fire. I feel good. Yes. And that can right. be the same good feeling as building a fucking hundred million dollar company. Yeah. Like, it's, no, for sure. Like, like pain, like suffering and and like success are like gas. Mm -hmm. where they just fill the space that they're in. So even if it can seem small objectively, subjectively, it's a massive achievement. Right. And for that reason, you like I just saw so many of these kids growing up that just had everything they wanted and immediately just go into pills. Immediately sure. go into like a longing for something, searching for something right. that they, again, that is that mindset. Yeah. Like uh, it's the opposite of scarcity. It's like an abundance mindset right. that I think can also be negative. But the abundance mindset Yes, coupled with giving everything to a child. Yeah, you're right. That is poisonous. You're gonna set your kid up. It's it's almost better that they're poor. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like a kid from the projects, but raised with that abundant mindset. Like, mm -hmm. like the way immigrant kids are. Yeah. You know, we're hanging out filming down in Miami with these Haitians and these Jamaicans, and like even unique. Mm -hmm. The first thing he told us about coming over from the island when he was eight years old, first time he had ever worn a pair of shoes, it's like money grows on trees in America, mm -hmm. grows on trees, and your only objective is to get it. Now, obviously, that was a problem because the way they were getting it was selling drugs, right? But, yeah. you know, you see their kids now, the second generation, they're like, dude, Half the people in Haiti are malnourished. Half. Mm -hmm. So when I'm here, there's no excuse. I can start a business. I, can, I own a water company. You see it in Miami, especially because it's so, you know, it's so dominated by immigrants. It's like, yeah, this guy has an apparel company, right? And it's, and it's moving, right? It's all possible. Everything's possible. So that's, that's really what it is. Everything is possible. Yeah. You know what I mean? And we're not going to starve to death and we're not going to be homeless. So like that would be like ideal, right? Is a kid raised to to have to go fend for himself, but to know that like he can he can achieve that if he's puts his mind to it. Yeah, I think you know that's I, mean? I think that's a good mentality. And like instilling the idea of what do you like what is the intersection of what you like to do that is beneficial to other people. That's marketable. Yeah. Right. That's what the market is, right? Yeah, yeah. Are are you doing something that has value? that people can give you money for. Yeah, you know and, I mean? and it has like some type of like good that comes out of it. Cause obviously yeah. there's things that people like that you like that could be negative, mm -hmm. a la drugs. Yeah. But could you create something that is beneficial to people in some capacity right. that you also really enjoy? Yeah. And if you can find that, and especially it's still that in a kid with like some type of like moral guidance to yeah. be like this, not that, yeah. then I think you can set a kid up. For, totally, and I think, you know, if, if you're rich or wealthy right if i'm if i'm rich if i'm really making it in show business or whatever it is i can show my kids you can have you can achieve this if this is what you want but i'm going to sit first class and you're going to be in coach mm -hmm. you know or i'm not even going to take you on vacation i me and the wife are going to go you know to mexico yeah but you're going to be stuck at home like i never got to go anywhere as a kid yeah like we would take road trips that was like the budget way to we're like getting out of here. Yeah, we're gonna go to Canada yeah, to yeah, a yeah. lake. Yeah, yeah. That's the extent of it all. So when I actually got to travel abroad, I wasn't. I was 21 years old, almost 22, and oh, it was wow. like it was the best time of my life because I'd never had it before. Right. So there's ways to there's ways to raise your kids with an abundant mindset and not make them pieces of shit. Yeah, I think that's completely. You know true. what I mean? Yeah. And I think it's a lot easier when you do have money because you just yeah. have options. You 100%. know. Yeah. So. So that's how I plan to do it. But I'd like I'd like for my kids to not think about money, mm -hmm. to not think about struggle. You know what I mean? I'd like them to see other people to uh, uh, who are struggling so they appreciate what they have. <laughs> yeah. But I'd like them to only be focused on like creating. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. What do you like that other people can benefit from? Yeah. Yeah. That, yeah. I think that's the best mentality. I just I've seen it so much with kids growing up that like would just get anything they wanted. Yeah. 
and they really lose themselves totally. and in the same way that kids grow up with nothing lose themselves yeah and uh yeah. Yeah, and it just, I think, it requires a lot of guidance. And it's a lot. all back, it's its all parenting, and, and those kids' parents are as absent as the kids from the projects whose dad's locked up and whose mom's fucking crap. Yeah, like, if your dad is some fucking, you know, Fortune 500 exec, yeah. like, he's spending no time with you. Mm -mm. You're getting raised by a nanny. Yeah. In the same way that, like, like you're getting raised by some Jamaican woman that came over here right. that's nannying you. Right. In the same way that, like, a Jamaican immigrant comes over and gets raised by some random auntie that's right. Jamaican, also married. Exactly. Like, you know what I'm saying? Exactly. Everyone's getting raised by a Jamaican yeah, woman. Jamaican yeah, Jamaican is... <laughs> to be the fucking the yeah, best yeah. housekeepers you know <laughs> yeah. but it's like when you're on either end of the spectrum i think that's where it's dangerous yeah but i think that's a good mentality i think that's cool yeah and as you just gotta put your kids on mushrooms i guess right yeah just offer so. it just Smoke weed. <laughs> yeah. you know do Molly. six years old be like yo give me that <laughs> <laughs> i don't know i think that's a cool that's a cool arc that you that you found yeah and but it's all comes from here yeah i so believe that if there's one thing i believe it is the power of the mind mm -hmm. because that's all the universe is. It, it is a, a, a shared intelligence, mm -hmm. right? Like that's probably what God is. I can't say for sure what God is, but God is, you know, he's not a guy. If, if there is a God, it's probably a man, but the <laughs> universal intelligence is what created everything that we have. Yeah. It's, it started as nothing, right? Just energy and intelligence and over billions of years, it formed, uh, you know, a galaxy. And from there it formed a planet. And from there, like these human beings sprung up. But that's all just a divine intelligence manifesting creation. Yes. Creation See? being the big thing. Yes, it's creation. Yeah. So, and then, you know, humans will reach a place like that singularity where we're all, you know, I don't want to be around to see that shit. Why? But when the singularity, when we, Why when we mesh, uh, because I'm old school. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, I like being human. Like, I will not join the robots. I will not get the, what do you call it? What's, yeah, what's Elon link. working on? I won't get the neural link. link. Yeah. You know, like, there's just some things that I won't give up. Mm -hmm. Right? Racism being one of them, you know? <laughs> but yeah. I don't want my kids. Staunchly individualistic. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. yeah, exactly. Like, that's probably not, not the most evolved mindset. Mm -hmm. Like, you want to move towards what will be perfection, <clears throat> excuse me, perfection. So, so yeah, I think like the, the operative word is like creation and that all comes from the divine intelligence and is now manifested through humans. Yes. What do you create in your mind? Yeah. You know? And how does that manifest in real life? Mm -hmm. Like what are the things that you're actually putting yeah. out there? And that's, that's completely how I feel. That's how I feel with stand up. Mm -hmm. where I'm like, yeah, it, the money is cool. But again, like as long as it's reaching a bare minimum threshold. Yeah. It's all right. Yeah. And comedy's tough because it's like, as you know, uh, there's, there's, you know, the real world, there's the material world and there's limitations, there's hardships. It's hard to do comedy <clears throat> if you can't get on stage all the time, yep. right? Like it's fucking you and I still battle to get spots. Yep. Whereas like Schultz can go pop in anywhere and do his creation. Literally. You know what I mean? But, uh, but he's been at it longer, yeah. you know? Yeah. And that's, but that's also why I like this show, just like podcasting in general. Yeah. Is like it is creating a conversation yep. that exists forever. That yep. again, even if like you know a thousand people see it, zero people see it, I still feel like the creation is enough. Yes, and I, I obviously I get caught up in the numbers and I get caught up in like, oh, is it doing good enough? Is it bad? Like, yeah, I was really in that you know like a year ago, a couple months ago, and now to an extent, but like I've worked hard to not be so obsessed with the constant right. feedback like i was obsessed with the analytics and still am mm -hmm. i really love the data right but consciously trying to remove myself from the uh numerical evaluation of creation do you have people that reach out to you and say hey i love the show yeah then that then you have to keep going yeah and that is the thing that is worth it but even if no one said that like mm. i would appreciate this yeah interaction i just it's hard for me to hate. i wouldn't be here that's, but what, so. <laughs> that's what i'm saying like like there's no uh, there's no situation where i could just call up unique and be like hey man can we talk right you know what i'm saying he's like he's a busy guy he's got stuff to do right but having some type of like uh offering to him yeah and you know same with you and same with anyone else like it's a there's a little less friction to try to connect with human beings when there's a platform yeah absolutely and that's the beauty and the real reason why i want a platform at all is just to connect with people 100 percent. no i think that's great that yeah. is very true and same with stand-up like the better i am at stand-up and the better i am at marketing it the more i can do it mm -hmm. so therefore i have to market yep. it. yep even though if it was just like yo you can get up anywhere like i try to envision a world where it's like okay you have enough money forever and anything you want to do you have the freedom to do it like without inhibition 
like let's say you had unlimited money and you could get do stage time anywhere in front of legit audiences that love to see stand up would you still do it and for me i'm like yeah i would just do stand up all the time even if no one knew about it yeah as long as i could just keep on doing it being in rooms with people even i if would I could too do the show. because you know what you're doing is you're giving yeah. Like when you go do stand up, you're giving of yourself. Yeah. Right. So for the same reason Seinfeld keeps doing it. Right. He's got unlimited money. Yeah. He Because it's you're literally giving when you're doing this, you're giving a piece of yourself. You're you're pulling back the curtain and you're giving these thousands of people to watch it, you know, uh, a glimpse into you and yes. like they relate to it. Yeah. You know what I mean? So and you're a giver. You yeah. were raised that way. Yeah. So it's like. You got no problems, yeah. you know? Yeah, and I think that's partially why things have kind of worked out thus far. Yeah. But again, even if like the views go down or whatever, I'm trying to remove myself from that. Like, mm -hmm. do you read a lot of the comments and stuff? I never read comments, really? almost never. I get people who hit me up, like wanting to, like gangsters that fuck with my show or like, you know, guys like Unique or Alex who we film with in Miami. Yeah. And they're like, yo, this cat's saying you're fucking phony. You want me to go kill him? Some shit like that. And I'm like, nah, back off. It's, it's all love. Oh, that's you know what wild. I mean? Yeah, yeah how, so, how was that Miami trip? Like, that was fucking amazing. With Alex. So, yeah, like, well, yeah. Well, can you give me backstory on him? Yeah, so Alex Montanez is the first nephew to Rafa Salazar. Rafa was featured in the Cocaine Cowboys documentary from back in the day, 2006. The best drug documentary that's ever been made. Florida Boys made it. Oh, wow. uh, the uh, guy, my name's escaping him. Producer, um, the Corbin Brothers. Okay. And they made Cocaine Cowboys, uh, the series. There's a new, they made a new one too. It's on Netflix. But that, and that's really big in the, you know, online community, the underworld. And it's a, the Cocaine Cowboys is about the first generation of Colombian drug traffickers who came to Miami and opened up the market they invented the cocaine business Whoa. and they, they were the ones getting their bricks so rafa was the the number one guy in miami he was getting bricks straight from pablo in colombia so he was obviously a billionaire himself right he made these people untold amounts of wealth Whoa. and his nephew was this guy alex so he's one of the last surviving uh people from that lineage mm -hmm. you know because everybody's dead yeah everybody's long been dead right uh, so we thought that'd be amazing to like, what, what does life look like now? Yeah, what for, a cool you life. Know? Yeah. And I mean, but it, you know, like those kids are really fucked up too. He grew up as a rich kid, but just from, you know, narco traffickers. Right. Yeah. So they, they all had problems, coke heads and, you know, not a good way to be raised either. Yeah. But and it was really amazing to like, you know, taking us around to Kendall, which is a Colombian neighborhood. Dude, he said there's so much money stashed in, in those fucking houses still from back in the day that like a new family will move into the neighborhood and they'll be renovating and they'll just knock a wall out and there'll be like millions of dollars in drug money still there. Whoa. Yeah. Do they get to keep it? Yeah. So what we fucking looked into this, you have to technically take that down, report it as missing. And then like to the police precinct, which you never do in Miami because that shit, that money will go missing. Yeah. Those cops to this day are fucking dirty, right? Because it's Latin. Yeah. It's yeah, such yeah, a yeah. Latin culture and the, and the culture in Latin America is corruption, yeah. right? So they bring that to Miami. But yeah, it, and if nobody claims it within like 30 or 60 days, you get to keep that money and just pay tax on it. Oh, that's crazy. Yeah. yeah. Like, so what a come up. You buy a house and then make money. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Immediately yeah, and buy house? another one with the fucking the Bro, money you just made. That's crazy. Yeah, so he took us to the first Caleta, which is like how they call a stash house, right? And then fucking showed us how the wall fucking... Uh, it doesn't spin around, actually. You just... It's a fake wall, and you would just... You could just move it. It was like a small little wheels, and you just fucking... Extend just it. Pull, uh, pull it to the side. Yeah, it'd be enough money for... Or enough space for as much money or kilos as you could put in there. Oh, that's crazy. Yeah, so and we saw that, and we went around to like the Haitian neighborhood. Yeah. Uh, we went to... We went down to the docks, you know, Yeah, all that shit. Really fascinating. How do you find the drug culture is different depending on the place that you are, whether you're in like New York, you know, like Pacific yeah. Northwest? Yeah, yeah. Well, obviously like the nationalities, right? Yeah. So it's completely dominated by uh, Colombians and Cubans down there. We mm -hmm. interviewed this Cuban guy. This episode's dropping. It'll all be, already be out by the time this comes out. He was like a Cuban guy uh, that used to work with Raul Castro. Fidel's brother Whoa. To, and he would yeah and their army and they would help him protect the drug shipments after coming from Colombia they would offload on the port in Cuba and then 
load the bricks on fast boats, send them to the U.S. So it's bullshit that fucking Cubans are not involved in drug trafficking, like the island of Cuba. It absolutely is. You think a lot of like Fidel's money back in the day was like related to that? It's possible. It's definitely possible. But again, it's a dictatorship. It's so it's so controlled. Yeah. And none of the drugs. The only difference is that like all those islands run drugs. Jamaica, the DR, Haiti, Cuba. The only difference is none of the drugs that get pa get passed through Cuba actually end up domestically for consumption. Mm. There's no drugs in Cuba, pretty much. Interesting. You know what I mean? So that's just like a waypoint. It's just a waypoint. Just a way station. Yeah. Oh, interesting. Yeah. And then in terms of like how people are spending the money, do you find it's different, like the way people flex? Like I didn't realize until talking to Unique that like the like rappers, which like it seems dumb now that I'm thinking about it, but like rappers are just <clears throat> emulating drug dealers. Like even if you're a rapper that's never been involved with drugs, you look at like the drug dealers are like the OG flexors. Yes. Like we are buying like the crazy souped up cars, like the chains, yep. all that shit. All of that came out of the drug culture. Yeah, like the, that, the car to match the outfit. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, like that, that, that came unique. out of like the drug culture mm. that merged with rap and obviously the rap game and like drug culture. They're so just similar. rapping about what they saw, yeah. who they grew up and with. And they're emulating the coolest guys in their neighborhood that's which right. happen to be drug dealers. That's so, right. Like, do you find that the way people flex is different depending on the culture? Or is it always just like cars, hey, clothes, surprise, women? surprise, surprise. I know this could be a controversial statement. The whites are better with money. <laughs> we all know this, you know? Um, but that's because white people have money longer. Right. And they generally just are less cool. They're less yeah, flashy. Yeah. They have less style. Yeah. So they just tend to just bury the shit and then just be really subtle with it. You yeah, know? Interesting. I saw a lot of white weed traffickers, especially guys that I used to re-up from. Bro, they fucking got away with that money and they got out of the game. So, so there are people that, that fucking make it out and, and live that dream. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I think the first generations of the, the immigrants uh, who come here and get involved in the drug game, especially back then, uh, there was never any real thought about like the future. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? It was like, let me take care of my mother and I'm prepared to die. The, the, the whole everything... The big through line to all of these gangsters is no fear of death because they come from a place that's like death. Mm. You know what I mean? So they come here and they're like, I'm in the struggle, uh, constant survival mode. And if it's my time to go, it's my time to go. And it's kind of an honorable way to live if you think about it because they are living for the day. Yeah. It's almost like what we were just talking about. Yeah. It's, it's, it can be a meditative way to live. You know, they are flashy and they fucking spend thousands of dollars at a strip club. It's because I get killed tomorrow. Yeah. So they're extremely in the present. Yeah. Almost they're too much. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. That's interesting. Yeah. They're just it's a high stress level when, you know, people are trying to gun you down. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. I'm always curious about like the like the human aspect of all of this. Yeah. Like, like the regardless of like culture and race and all that shit. Like once you get money and you're in that kind of like high stakes game. Yeah. It's always like, okay, cars, women, mm. chains, like how can I show off my wealth in the craziest way? Yeah. And it's just interesting that it always is the same things. Yeah. You know what exactly. I mean? Like it's just always like like it's a biological thing. Yeah. But freedom is what they have. They 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 do it because it is freedom. Because money is freedom. Yeah. At least in the material world. But it's something that I realized and I always craved mm -hmm. was that the way that like they're in, in in a society that's so controlled, you know, you're controlled everywhere you go. Mm -hmm. They are outlaws, you know what I mean? And the rules don't really apply to them. Yeah. You know now, what I mean? In spite of the fact that what you did compared to a lot of these guys, like yeah. in terms of jail time, in terms Drop of like, in the bucket. Yeah. So it's like, do you feel more connected to them in ways? Like now, like when I meet a comic, like mm -hmm. there's an instant rapport and there's like an instant like understanding of like, okay, there's jokes that I can say around you that I wouldn't say around other people. Yeah. And there's things that I can do in ways I can behave. Like there's a camaraderie that comes with it. Yeah, for sure. And I'm curious, like, do you find yourself connecting with them in deeper ways because of the same kind of drive? Or is it actually almost more alienating because you're like, I was doing my shit, but I'm not like you guys. Yeah, yeah. No, I, that's interesting. I think, <clears throat> I don't know. I don't know. I feel like I don't obviously now because I'm so removed from the game. Yeah. I, I am taking a more journalistic approach to it, mm -hmm. you know, like I understand, but I understand these guys a lot. I'm like, God damn, I was locked up with all of you. And, you know, I wish you could just 
change, you mm. know? But a lot of them are changing, right? They have YouTube channels. A lot of them are back in the game. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, yeah, no, no, I, the entrepreneurial spirit is what I share with them the most. Yeah. You know, I'm like driven. I'm like, fuck yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Especially being, especially being in Miami. I'm like, yeah, you're right. Like, let me take some of that immigrant mindset, which I think the immigrant mindset is really a, it's, it's what middle class people like myself didn't have growing up. Was that like, no excuses. You can do it. You can be your own person. You can have your own business. You can make your own money. Yeah. You, like don't, money's have not, a, you don't have to be a cog in someone else's exactly. machine or whatever. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Which is everything you saw. Everyone was working at like a factory, a plant, a fucking whatever I'm from Portland. job. We, I, we did not work in factories. There, we I worked thought, in I thought cubicles. there was a lot of factories in Portland. No, no, no. no. It's oh, cubicles, really? right? Yeah. It's like this guy's dad's a assistant principal. Gotcha. My dad works for a lawyer for a you know corporation. Yeah. Like it was very like solidly middle class. But they were all cogs in a greater way. For sure. For sure. Yeah. Whereas all these guys are just born into entrepreneurship exactly because there's no other choice yeah yeah i'm curious like do you ever want to like expect, like now most of the guys you talk to are not uh i think your water's that way oh that, oh shit no you got you got a little drop in that one too um any of these guys you meet do you wish like the ones that are still in it mm -hmm. like most of the guys you're having on the channel are kind of out or yeah. removed but the ones that are still in it is there any party that wants to be like bro there's another way like like any of these guys that hit you up, like, bro, like yeah. teach me whatever. Now, now I'm like, damn, it's the worst time to get in into the drug game. Yeah. I just, I don't even respond when people are like, hey, I got some advice. I'll pay you. Can I give you five grand for a sit down? I'm like, I think that's like a federal crime. Like, I can't even like <laughs> consult you. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. So I just, I feel like it's such, I want to be like, dude, there's so many ways to make money. And the, yeah. the odds of you doing this right and getting out and making huge money are so slim. And especially if you're fucking hitting me up and asking me on Instagram, you know what I mean? And like, it's just, yeah, you're making mistakes already. Yeah. You're making yeah. exactly, <laughs> yeah. exactly. And so, you're so talented and you have this drive in the spirit. Like yeah. you could go do anything. Yeah. You don't necessarily have to do this, especially yeah. not at this time. Yeah. I, I think it's just like, I think I really was of the last generation of regular dudes that could blow up, as we used to say, and yeah. become rich off of middle manning drugs. Yeah. You know what I mean? I think now it's like you're either part of the cartel and there's nothing I can say to you, right? Or you're, you know, doing it on a very low level and you got to sell all different kinds of goofy shit. And it's just like, eh, that's yeah. for that's for kids. If you're yeah. a teenager, I guess. Yeah. As long as you're like knowing that like, okay, after college, we got to make a change. Yeah, I'm going to use this to pay for college. Yes, some exactly. Yeah. Like my buddy Reggie did. Like mm -hmm. my best friend and, and drug dealing partner, at least back then. But dude, he got out of the game like without a scratch. Like he like he paid for his tuition. You know, he paid his rent. Yeah. Didn't, was no burden on his parents, right? And he was like, dude, we just like, we're living the dream. And I'm like, no, <laughs> we got to make millions, yeah. right? So it's like if, but if kids just could see that like this should just be like a training kit for like the legitimate world, like that's the best way to fucking, you know, sell drugs. That's yeah. the best way to be part of the game. If right? you want to be part of the game. Yeah. 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 But, but even, it's like being an alcoholic. Everybody's an alcoholic in college. You party, take beer bongs out of your ass. Yeah. You know what I mean? <laughs> but after college, if you're still doing that, like you, we might have, we might have a drinking problem. That's interesting. Yeah. That's a good way to phrase it. Do you have any uh, episodes coming up that you're, you're excited about? Yeah, well, the one dropping tomorrow is with that guy Apache, that Cuban drug trafficker. Um, fucking incredible. Looked like Stephen Bauer, a Manolo from Scarface, too. Like, the such a Cuban-American fucking Cubano, you know? We're yeah. fucking selling. He's like, the van would pull up, and it'd be a thousand keys, and the Colombians would say, take as many as you want. Like, yeah. Oh, that's fine. That shit is fucking crazy. We're going to Detroit to film with this guy who used to be enforcer for the mafia in Detroit. Detroit has a huge mob history nobody knows about jimmy hoffa was whacked in detroit oh that's right so yeah so we got that coming up interviewing a fucking corrections officer we're talking to this guy who used to work with the cartels out of arizona and he would get like hundreds of pounds delivered to him a day just fresh off the border did 10 years in a mexican prison 
in a Mexican prison. Yeah, yeah. it's next level. The next level. You dude. saw like those pictures of like the Salvadorian prison where like they're all like lined oh, up. Oh my basically, god! Like, yeah. Just like fucking yeah, chained yeah. together. Well, that's like, like torture. They're doing that. That's them cracking down on MS-13. <sighs> in Mexican prison, there's no rules. You're just getting oh, stabbed. If you can't pay your way into a nicer part of the prison. You're going to be getting in some knife fights. Oh, fuck. no ifs, ands, or buts. So. Yeah, we got a lot of cool stories, though. So check out the channel, The Connect with Johnny Mitchell. Yeah, it's yeah. dope. I really love all the stuff I've seen. Thanks, man. man. You do a Appreciate great job. It, dude. You do a great yeah. job. You have a great knowledge of everything, and you're able to ask the right questions in order to like get really interesting tidbits Thank and you. stories. Thank you. It's that's, really cool. That's where I came up with the idea. I'm like, what if somebody actually talked about the details of drug trafficking that was in it? Yeah. You know? It's dope, so man. thanks, man. Yeah. yeah, and check out my comedy too. I do stand up comedy. Yes. Believe it or not. Yeah, not only in prisons. You yeah, yeah around, not just prisons. Yeah, yeah. almost world. exclusively in the free world. <laughs> nice, dude. Keep yeah. it that way. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. That's dope, brother. Thank you so much for coming thanks on. Thanks for and, having uh, me. It's a pleasure, Marky. I appreciate you, brother. Let's go do stand up. All right.